I'll start with a uh, reading of the appeal statement. Pursuant to the provisions of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, Davidson County Community Oversight Board may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review under a common law writ of cert. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final decision by the board. Any person or other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure that time and procedural requirements are met. We do have quorum. We have seven members here. Um, I will take a motion to approve the minutes. Does anybody move to so approve? Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. Um, any focused discussion on the minutes? Any corrections? If there are none, uh, all in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to open the floor for the board here to talk about if the board is so inclined. Uh, Chief Drake's response to um, my letter regarding license plate readers. Um, if you all had a chance to look at that, if you had any further questions that we should propose to Chief Drake, um, any reactions, happy to hear those now. If there are none, um, we can move to yes. Dr. Hildreth. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for this opportunity to uh, engage and observe the correspondence around the license plate readers. We know that this is a matter of great concern to the community. There have been a number of um, proposed ordinances placed before City Council. This seems to be the third touch. And I had the privilege of attending a special called public meeting yesterday evening at the Nashville main branch of the public library. I believe it was coordinated by the state's attorney's office, the public defender's office, as well as supported by council where there was an opportunity for public comment. I think it's important to note that there are obviously we serve the entire community and there are a range of views from this is important to help protect life in my community um, to protect property i'm a business owner but it seems that uh, numerically it seemed that a preponderance of the concerns were based around those that were broader and systemic about surveillance and uh, I think one person said very clearly that data and systems are not neutral and they tend to absorb and perpetuate the um, biases of the persons who create them or interpret them. And so we are extremely fortunate on this board to have staff who are engaged in the business of data collection and interpretation, who also do research and make policy recommendations to us. And I would just ask that staff be continued to be assigned to the job of watching this and reporting to this as we go along. I am sorry that I do not have any more specific comments on the correspondence you laid before us. While well, I'm glad we received it, I did not expect this as an agenda item, and so I spent my time of research and analysis on the PRRs and the other things, and we may have other members who feel similarly. So we just I just want to state on the record that a lack of robust conversation right now does not correspond with a lack of interest or concern. And I believe I speak for myself, I see heads nodding on this panel that we want to stay in the conversation. We want to have as much information as early as possible. And my last note on this is that I do understand that the source of funding 
for this technology, were it to become a part of the public environment, is of great concern to community members. There is a concern that there's a possibility that this may be funded in part or in whole by private entities that would somehow circumvent the level of public scrutiny that we absolutely insist on. And so I'm going to ask you, Mr. Chair, to ensure that you have early access to the communication that's going on, that you will keep and bring forward the question of if this were to happen, what is the source of funding? How will the public be able to scrutinize it with the level of any other commensurate public procurement? And what will this board do to ensure that process as well as outcome are fair, just, equitable, and serve the community who elected us? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hildreth. Any other comment, question? If not, we can move to Dr. Valier for the soft empty hand reporting ad advisory report. All right, thank you, good afternoon. Um, so I'll be starting with the discussion, or I'll be presenting a little about the report that was uh, released at the last board meeting um, for public comment. And I'll be following the same presentation from the last uh, special called meeting to make sure that any viewers are aware of what's in the report and we can be transparent around uh, what's being discussed before um, the board tonight. Um, so this re this report uh, follows uh, a revision to the Metro Nashville Police Department policy manual regarding use of force, uh, which was released in August. Um, and subsequently, uh, we the board reviewed the policy rec or the policy changes, as well as how those related to previous policy recommendations from both the Community Oversight Board and the Mayor's Policing Policy Commission. One area that stood out that was not reflected in the policy changes was reporting of soft empty hand control techniques. And this that was the genesis of this report. Um, uh, to, to start with a quick definition, soft empty hand control uh, is, uh, could you go to the previous slide? Uh, soft empty hand control is the use of physical strength and skill in defensive tactics to control arrestees who are reluctant to be taken into custody and offer some degree of physical resistance. Such techniques are not impact oriented and include pain compliance pressure points, controlled takedowns, joint manipulation, or simply grabbing a sub subject. Touching or escort holds may be appropriate for use against levels of passive resistance. Uh, currently, a use of force report is not required when soft empty hand control is the highest force used in an incident and there's no allegation of an injury. Uh, the police department uses a force continuum to guide uh, use of force uh, training as an application. Uh, soft empty hand control is the step beyond verbal direction when verbal directions fail. Uh, soft empty hand control would be the next step in the force continuum prior to the use of conducted energy devices or tasers or chemical spray or hard empty hand control, which includes punches, kicks, or closed fist um, applications of force. Um, soft empty hand control, unless there's an injury, does not require a uh, report currently. And that uh, there was a recommendation both from the Community Oversight Board uh, last October and from the Mayor's Policing Policy Commission last November uh, in, to add that as a required report in, in those instances. Next slide. Uh, as part of this report, we wanted to understand how common this was across the nation, as well as how common it is as a force application. And so we, the analysts for the uh, Metro National Community Oversight, we took data from four departments uh, or found reports from four departments where soft empty hand control was the highest use of force in force incidents. And we found that anywhere between one in six to as high as one in three uses of force in those departments were uh, 
had high had soft to hand, hand as the highest uh, force, and those would not be reportable currently for for National Police Department. We also looked at how common this was across the nation in the largest 50 police departments, uh, 47 of the largest 50 departments, uh, according who were identified in the Bureau of Justice Statistics uh, analysis of the police of largest departments. 51% of the 47 departments that had public policies had a reporting standard more comprehensive than, than our police department and included soft empty hand control as a part of their reporting requirements. So as part of our analysis, we, we focus on why this should take place, why uh, a policy recommendation uh, could be issued and uh, what would be the benefit of that. Uh, so accountability is a core tenant of what we discuss. And, and so tracking low level force in response to resistance is important for accountability of officers, for managing officers, for the department to understand uh, the, type, the types of force officers are using. And it can be a tool for early intervention. So if officers do have, uh, are using more force than uh, previously, or they're having wellness issues, substance abuse issues, those could be identified early through an early intervention system. And, and having data on uh, the level of force just beyond uh, verbal direction uh, when de-escalation efforts are, are failing and, and they're requiring to use force it is an important step of evidence and data to have in order to identify officers with concerns. Transparency is another core tenet uh, uh, of the board. This would give a more accurate picture of the types of force that community members experience, as well as the types of resistance that officers are encounter encountering. So it, it provides transparency on both sides of the equation. We don't, right now don't have a full uh, picture of either side. Um, we know more serious forces and there's a well-documented process for, for investigating more serious uses of force above the threshold, um, but this would give a, a more complete picture. Um, it would also help uh, provide a better evidence base. And so we, we could evaluate whether de-escalation trainings are effective because we would have information on uh, that transition point between uh, when, when officers are having to uh, put their hands on people or, or use physical force to get people into handcuffs. And, um, and that's an important piece of evidence that can be used to evaluate programming or, and training. And also risk, it, it can also reduce officer and city liability. So having comprehensive reporting of uses of force in, in the case where there could be a lawsuit against the city and, and, or against an officer, uh, having tracking in place in order to, to document that it was reported, it was looked at by a supervisor and that there weren't concerns at the time um, can be an effective tool to reduce liability. Um, so in developing this report, we developed three policy proposed recommendations. The first is that all uses of soft empty hand control uh, used to overcome resistance should be immediately reported to an officer supervisor and required a written report that's tracked by MMPD. Tracking of all uses of soft empty hand control used to overcome resistance should begin by January 1st, 2022. And second is officers using soft empty hand control techniques to overcome resistance without an allegation of injury should be required to complete a form 108S, a form that would be created by MMPD to collect information about soft empty hand control when the force doesn't rise to the current 108 reporting level. And in the report, we do uh, spell out a couple ways that this could be implemented and use current reporting standards of the 108F form, which is the firearm display report, uh, to uh, show how, the, how this could be an, uh, in, integrated into the uh, process of the police department. Uh, and then third was a, is a recommendation to Metropolitan Council to amend uh, the section on reports required uh, to be given to council from the police department uh, to require quarterly and annual reporting of use of force reports um, that are posted on the MMPD website, sent to Metro Council, and sent to the executive director of the COB, 
That includes the number of uses of force incidents where soft empty hand control is, uh, used to overcome resistance is the highest force used and there's no allegation of injury. And we did include a sample ordinance in the appendix of the report. Uh, so the process for uh, the community oversight board to issue policy recommendations, uh, the board voted to release this for public comment at the last meeting. Um, the, the policy advisory report, if it's the standard process, would be the only agenda item. Uh, and then the board would evaluate uh, whether to issue the report. Since this is an expedited report uh, that was approved for expedited status by the executive committee, uh, the second and third steps could happen at the same time. Um, and we held public comment at the special called meeting uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we have we've stayed open to receiving public comment, um, and we haven't had uh, much comment since uh, the public comment session. Uh, the board can consider the report and recommendations together or separately. Uh, the board can consider recommendations individually or all together and choose which to approve. And once the report is issued, the proposed recommendations become COB recommendations and they reflect the position of the board. Oh, and I left the comment slide in there, but um, so I'm happy to answer any questions or um, Thank you, Dr. Valier. Mr. Goddard. I had one question, and I thought that was a topic of fun, so I think the answer is right. The definition you had of the MNP, the divided empty uh, open hand control, as one of the qualifiers was to control an SD, very literally, but only the definition only applies to controlling an SD. My understanding is your recommendation would apply to any use. Um, that in the situations where those tactics are used, um, sorry, I'm trying to think of, of how that definition would play into the um, recommendation itself. Yeah, that, 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 that is a very good question. Um, and that's not one since the we specified specifically in the recommendation um, the overcoming resistance um, since there can be a, a range of soft empty hand control usage um, and we're specifically interested in those situations where officers are using those tactics in order to overcome um, resistance from community members or from uh, potential arrestees or subjects. Um, so there could be situations where the person is not arrested, where those, those uh, tactics are used, um, and they should uh, be included in a report. And if you don't think that the la that language encapsulates that, I think that's an area where we could clarify. through all that again. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> all right. the, the question was whether uh, was noting, which I hadn't noted before, that the MNPD definition of soft empty head controls just limit, just defined it in terms of with respect to an arrestee. And my question was, is our proposed policy limited to that definition or designed to require reports of use of these controls, whether the individual against whom they were used or on whom they were used was an arrestee or otherwise. And uh, Dr. Lear's response was, it was not intended to be limited to just arrestees. And my final comment was, if and when we get to a motion to approve, I would like to grant uh, Dr. Valier the opportunity to review that, and he believes clarifying, 
language changes are necessary to make that clear, he'd be authorized to do that. And I think with, within the recommendation, uh, the clause whether or not an arrest is made could be added um, to, in order to clarify okay. that whether or not a, an arrest is made, if uh, those techniques are used, uh, it should, requ it should no. trigger a reporting requirement. And my last request is, if I do this again, if anyone at the DS or otherwise would say, Drew, you need to punch the button, I will not be offended and appreciative. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. I'm looking at the recommendation here, and it says it starts with all uses of soft and empty hand control techniques used to overcome resistance should be immediately reported to an officer's supervisor and required a written report that is tracked by MNPD. Tracking of all uses of soft empty hand control techniques used to overcome resistance should begin by January 1st, 2022. I think that. Well, the lawyer in me says that phrase is defined elsewhere in the report mm -hmm. to be just arrestee. So that's the concern that another lawyer Got could it. point to and create some narrowing that I'm trying to eliminate. A, a normal person wouldn't have the question I've got. I apologize. <laughs> um, Mr. Wynn and then Mr. Kamaluch. Yeah, I, I did, well, I mentioned that, I, and you probably know this, that this is used a lot in first responders to domestic violence calls. It's required for officers to separate the parties to do an interview, eyesight, earshot, so you can get a clear idea of what's going on. That might not mean that you'll arrest somebody because you physically placed them in a chair, put them in the back of your patrol car for your safety and the safety of all the parties. So that happens very often. I mean, the officers may not want to hear me say this, but filling out a 108 may be necessary in some of those cases. So I think to include that would be important. But I had another question. Um, you know, all this uh, to me seems a, a bit of a measurement and risk benefit for the police department. What has the police department said so far about how they view that? In other words, what is their evaluation of the risk of not implementing this policy considering this board was recommending it and the mayor's committee recommended it? What, what was their, in the past, I, I don't want to judge present leadership, we're not there yet, but what did they say why they didn't want to do this as, as part of recording this kind of um, call for an officer to uh, 108 for a soft to hand control? Uh, I, I mean, I can't really speak to the police department's uh, reasoning for not uh, changing it with, with the use of force policy. Um, you know, we have been told that it, it was still under consideration to some uh, and, but it was not changed with the use of force. Um, so I can't, I don't want to speculate on uh, what I don't necessarily know. So you've never had a meeting with the, with the command staff, the police department, who said, we're not going to do this because of A, B, or C. That's never happened? Um, we, I've had conversations, uh, I had a conversation where, you know, it was discussed and it was stated that they had, they thought that you know, they they're said that they were requiring reporting to a supervisor, but no documentation of that report to a supervisor. Um, and they felt that that was an appropriate um, step that fill, that met the um, recommendation from the board. And uh, I did not, in conversations with Director Fitcher, that we did not feel that that was meeting the recommendation of the board. Yes, yeah, so, so they, they're, you, you take that as their supervisor is basically filling out the 108 for the officer. Is that what um, it sounds like to you? Th that, the, that the supervisor would decide whether or not it met the reporting requirement for a 108. Got yeah. um, And then the supervisor would guide the officer in whether or not a 108 would be required. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch and then Mr. Holloway. Oh, thank you. Uh, I feel like. A lot of my thunder was already stolen by uh, uh, Member Goddard and Member Wynn. Uh, but uh, quick question, uh, why January 1st? Um, so having a complete year of data is important uh, for analytical reasons, um, making sure that we can have a full comparison year as we move forward. So if we're able to have a full year of data for 2022, um, that would allow us to compare 2022 to 2023 um, without having to potentially make adjustments for having an incomplete year, calendar years of data. 
Um, you know, I, I do think having it starting as soon as possible is always preferable. Um, however, there are implementation needs that need to happen. And so giving a timeline as, you know, the board has discussed with other recommendations, having timelines is important. And being able to say this is our, ex our expectation would be that um, it would begin no later than uh, the first of the year. Thank you. What would, now I just have two more questions. What would implementation look like in your in your mind when it comes to just like best practices, what you've seen throughout the research, just what does implementation look like? Can you paint that picture for us? Uh, so in the report, we do talk about two potential ways to implement it. And I think, you know, I, I think some of the implementation should be left to the police department because they're the ones that have to make sure that it works for their, um, within their systems and within their process. Um, but we do lay out two potential ways that this could be implemented, which both should work within their process. One would be to combine the uh, the 108 F form with into a 108 S, which would basically be a short form, um, which would encompass both soft empty hand control and firearm displays. And that's actually very common around the country is that um, departments that have uh, force levels, um, that use force levels, which most of those departments have gone through a consent decree and the Department of Justice has made recommendations mm -hmm. um, to rank force into levels. And those level one forces are soft empty hand control without injury and firearm displays. And so those could be combined into a, one report. And, and then anything above that, which is the current 108 form, would continue as is. The other implementation that we suggested could be adding another form. So you would then have four 108 versions of the 108. You would have the 108, the 108F for firearm displays, 108T for tasers, and then the 108S for soft empty hand control. Um, either I think it would fit the, and any of the recommendations and would uh, meet the you know, exp reporting expectations and would be use would provide useful information. Um, I think leaving that to which the department prefers uh, is, you know, important part. So they, they're able to implement it within their system so that they understand, you know, what it looks like as, you know, and, and how that implementation would happen. Thank you. And then my last question goes on the same road as what Member Wynn was talking about. Um, what has there been any preliminary response from MMPD about this report here? And the reason I'm asking because it's been public, so I'm just curious if there's been any response or anything that we can prepare for as far as what's next. Um, so I'll uh, hand that to Director Fitcher if she doesn't mind um, to talk about uh, answering Mr. Campbell Gutierrez's question about. Any response from the police department around the report? Yeah, so um, I haven't heard anything from the police department directly. I did talk to um, Mr. Bunton about it um, in the mayor's office um, because, you know, he wanted to, some understanding on this particular policy advisory report, and the conversation pretty much centered around. The fact that the police department also this particular um, this particular recommendation was in the policing policy commission, um, and it was within they had to implement this I think within 12 months. And so my concern was that they hadn't done that. I think we also made a recommendation for it in our use of force um, consent decree. They didn't do it at that moment either. And then um, and then. My concern was that when I spoke with Dr. Valier about it, and if we want to get this implemented and have that kind of data, then they need to have it done pretty quickly. And that's why it's an expedited report. Um, Mr. Bunton's response was that um, the police department had been considering implementing this and that they were working on um, the possibility of implementing it sometime next year, the early part of next year. Um, and so that's what I heard. Um, but we didn't get a direct response from them. Um, we hadn't heard from them about this report. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you for that. I think uh, 
my, my comment, and this is, isn't a question, it's going to be like, what do we do if this goes ignored again? You know what I'm saying? What are our legal options? What do we do next? Because uh, clearly it's a lot of people that think that this should be something that is both tracked and understood. So that's just my last comment. Thank you for answering all the questions. And, and I will add this. You know, they changed their use of force policies recently. And that if this was super important, they would have included this during that time. Um, we find it to be important, and when we think about, when I think about it, soft, empty hand control, um, I've looked over some videos and some things of that nature just to see, like, what exactly um, does this look like? And, you know, at times it can appear to be somewhat violent encounters. And so I think it's important that we are documenting this, that we are protecting the the complainants would protect, uh, it, well, the citizens of our communities and also the police department in our city because, you know, this is a very important issue and I, I think that the board should take this into consideration. Mr. Holloway. The, um, the soft uh, empty hand, um, if you use it on a, a citizen, he should be under arrest. If not, it could be reversed towards you because if he complained on you and said you assaulted him and you didn't arrest him, then they won't know why. You know, you can lose your job easily. And um, it could be a tool uh, documenting um, what's really going on in the police department, you know, how much force being used. And um, it could show the department being one of the most violent police departments around if you document it every time somebody do a soft, empty hand uh, tactic. But it also could be a tool to let them know that we're not going to tolerate it. And you can uh, keep an idea on what's going on. And some officer, <clears throat> it's a good thing because you can see what he's doing on his job. Uh, you got one particular officer you're having a problem with, and, and you look at his file where he got X number 108 form where he used the 108 form. So we must do something about that. We need to find out what is the problem. Does he need counseling, or do we need to move him to another location where he deal less with people? So it could be a great tool, you know, but uh, if you put your hands on him, he is arrested. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Mr. Hayes. Yeah, I also think it would, it's something that really needs to be implemented. And I did notice that uh, in the report you said it, it, it would not require any additional financial uh, uh, resources for the police department. Uh, and also, as far as, as far as additional paperwork, I could imagine that that's probably something that the police may be pushing back on. But what I would say on that is if this particular policy saves one life, it's worth the extra pa paperwork, if it is extra paperwork. And it may not be any additional because we do have the body cameras now. So that's another tool where we can record what, what happened there. Uh, and really what, what uh, Member Camel Gooch was saying about what is our next option, I'm, I'm really glad that the council, uh, that you recommend that, that this be changed in the charter because uh, uh, our track record of us making recommendations and they're being taken seriously is, in my opinion, is not that great. So I think we do need that step. So I would encourage the board to approve both of those, both recommendations. Thank you. Judge Brown. Uh, I generally agree with uh, the, the, feasibility, the feasibility of, of this uh, report, and I think it probably would add a good bit to accountability, and uh, I support it. The only one question was a very minor point was that it did require the supervisor to complete an action and, at before the end of the shift, my experience would be that any time you have more reports, they, they tend to get filed toward the end of the shift. And I'm sort of concerned that we start pushing a little bit too much too quick that maybe we give the supervisor the next shift, uh, the next shift to complete uh, a report of it because if they all come in at the last, then the supervisor is going to be loaded up there 
Uh, and I, that's a very technical point, but uh, I support the uh, general recommendation. Thank you, Judge Brown. Mr. Goddard. I'm sorry, this is uh, just general discussion as opposed to questions. I do have one concern about the proposal, and, and it's a process concern, and that is recommending a Metro Council ordinance at this point in the process. Um, I've looked at the state statute and our charter, the state overrides it. I think there's a decent argument we can make recommendations to Metro Council, so I'm not saying that we can't do that. I, my understanding is where we are in the process is we all know what, what we've seen. We haven't asked the police department yet officially for their response to all this. If they are receptive, I fully expect there will be fine tunings of the form of report and various other things they'll propose that we may or may not like when we see it. I'm going to recommend, ask for a vote on, if I'm voted down, that's fine, that we change the Metro ordinance to a part of the policy and part of the policy be that Metro police will make the various reports on the same time frames, that be part of the policy. If we want that to be a Metro ordinance, we can today or we can, when we get finished with the process and, and see what we like or don't like about the policy, make that ordinance recommendation to Metro Council. I would suggest we talk to a few council people first, ask our executive director to and or chairman to confirm we can get some support on that. Um, but basically that's a lot of words. I, again, the. the uh, at the appropriate time, I would make a motion that we change the Metro Ordinance recommendation in the report to be instead a set of recommendations with the exact same substance and time frames to the police department as part of the policy we're asking them to adopt. Welcome your thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. Do you want to go ahead and make that motion? All right, I so move. Any second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Any focused discussion on that? Mr. Campbell Gooch. So first first question, um, and this I guess this is to you, Peter, uh, Dr. Valier. Why did you add this as an ordinance? Uh, so we added that as a as an option for the board. Um, so based on board discussions over the past several meetings around um, the uh, about recommendations potentially not having and uh, having as as much weight um, as as a policy option for situations where uh, a recommendation had not been implemented and uh, that the board could make that recommendation and um, you know there, the board is also able to defer specific recommendations and so it could be something that you know is deferred until the next meeting which then could be, or, or the first two recommendations could be approved w without the third recommendation until the next meeting. Um, and so the, the board does have options of, of sort of the order to approve them in. The report could be issued without the thir third recommendation um, and the third recommendation can be deferred. Um, so th so that, is, that is an option as well. Okay, uh, thank you. And then what, what I wanted to say is I do like uh, Mr. Goddard's idea about separating the two and then the, then the then the second one being a step that we take if the first one's not if the recommendations are not adopted i do like that as a as another step my concern is pushing back the start date um to something later than january seeing that if i understand it policy commission it's been done we've been recommending this for quite some time so I like the idea, but I think for me personally, what would make me feel better is if we had dates that were, and I hate the word time, uh, deadlines, but that were at least like, we get here, if this, if this hasn't changed here, we go here, and if it hasn't changed by this time, we go there. Um, Dr. Hildreth. Thank you. I also like the direction of this conversation. I do think having a sequence and a sequence with timed triggers. And so um, if I can make a suggestion, I don't know if this is a friendly amendment or not. Let me just talk it out. Um, let's move the timeline up to implement it as soon as possible. Being a, a data nerd, I do share 
the desire for the cleanliness of aligning a clear year, but we can always start and then start the collection and counting or, you know, we're collecting the data, but we're reporting on a calendar year to be homologous with other entities so that we have apples to apples, right? So I am in favor of moving in the direction of member Campbell Gooch to move the implementation time up. I am in favor of member Goddard, so I guess this is the meat of the motion before us, taking the requirements in the proposed ordinance and dropping them into the policy recommendation so that we're asking the police department to start doing it and we are collecting the data now and then holding in abeyance as one does with progressive discipline the possibility of escalating to the recommended conversation with council and the perhaps opening of an ordinance if what we're doing before that doesn't work. So I'm wondering, does that f sound like all that I'm asking for is to amend your motion to move up the implementation date, but otherwise I'm aligned? Yes, that sounds fine, that's accepted. Okay, thank you. I just had a quick note of reminder that in the MOU, they have a 45-day response to this process. So, so think about that as you're talking about implementation. So we may not, so we may not get to October 1st anyway because it's the end. I mean, we're at October 45. It'd be Christmas time if they make it. Mm -hmm. So maybe October, maybe October 1 is still clean and fine. But January, January. Uh, Mr. Hayes. Okay, I'll say I'm warming up when um, Dr. Hilder mentioned about, you know, moving the date up. But I still have a, a concern that uh, with changes in administration, that all of a sudden this is recommended and then all of a sudden it's thrown out. Uh, but if it's put in, in the ordinance, is there, and it's a lot harder to change that. Uh, that's just my concern. Uh, uh, and that was one reason with the referendum for the community oversight is that, you know, it was a, it's a document there. So that's, that's just a concern. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Judge Brown, did you have anything? No. Yeah, no. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't. I wanted to make sure I wasn't speaking out of turn. Um, so uh, my question for Board Member Hayes is: Then what would you are you suggesting? Are you suggesting? Are you suggesting that we keep everything the same and give them the ordinance with the recommendations? Are you suggesting that we? Um, yeah, I'm just curious on what you are suggesting. Uh, this is this this conversation keeps changing, so I'm I'm really not sure what the best thing to do. Uh, I just feel that we do need we do need that ordinance uh, to give this some weight uh, based on the experiences that we've had. Uh, but I do understand uh, member member uh, Drew's you know point about you know, actually going there. So maybe if we did separate the two, uh, separate the two, but uh, I'm, I'm just still kind of hesitant on that. I just, I just don't know right at this point. I think that there's a suggestion that um, Dr. Valier and I talked about regarding how this process could work if in fact you didn't want to do the ordinance, and that is deferring the ordinance until the next board meeting. Um, was it the next board meeting or December? Which, which, uh, the next board meeting is less than 45 days, which they would not be required to respond by that because point. That's the um, but right. 45 days will be about the December board meeting. Okay. Um, which will be sort of mid, mid December based on the holiday schedule. Um, so that could be a, that's a potential as well. Yeah. Mr. Goddard. 
But yeah, I was that's right along with what I, right along with what I was going to say. If I've got the calendar right, we'll get 45 days is before a week or so before our December board meeting with the reschedule time, I believe. And if so, we get that. I think we need to be clear in our communication to the department. And hopefully, Commander Lara can help with that. That we really do need to have a full response by the 45 days. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to amend my own motion if I can do that. I'm not sure what Robert's rule says about that. To say on the first two parts what I've already moved and, and with the friendly amendment and on the ordinance to defer it until the December board meeting, if all that lines up. So the, the motion is to just to accept the first two and defer? No, the, the motion stays the same with respect to the first two. That the, the ordinance comes out, it's replaced with recommended policy with the same dates and times, but then on the ordinance piece, that that consideration of whether to recommend that ordinance to Metro Council, that is deferred to the December meeting. So okay. We'll see what happens in response to the, from MNPD, if that makes sense. Dr. Hildreth. Thank you. So I'm tangled up. I, I believe that Member Goddard's motion is still important because if we're talking about recommendations one and two, which I see on page seven of the report, we still need to amend these two recommendations to have all of the meat of the proposed ordinance yes. pulled into the recommendation. Attorney Unit, would, would that be right? That's what I have. That Right now, the motion is uh, by Member Goddard, one and two as is, uh -huh. MPD. The third would be deferred. And then there's actually a sort of a fourth now uh, recommendation to the MNPD that the meat of what's in number three to council be a policy change and with feedback re uh, requested by 45 days, which would be before the December meeting. Almost. My motion was that to approve one and two with the change that, as uh, right. Member Hill just, just stated, with the change that it, the meat, uh, good phrase, meat of the ordinance be added as a change in addition to the policy that goes to MNPD. So one and two approved with that change, that goes to MNPD as the recommended policy. Probably need to stop that motion there on vote on it, but I anticipate there would be a second motion that says on number three, we view that as a proposed met, uh, recommendation to Metro Council, and we defer consideration of that until the December meeting. Gotcha. Right. And that's what I heard, and that's what I'm specific on, because looking at this language in the proposed ordinance, it is far more detailed than either of these two top two paragraphs up here. I'm hearing, and will support, support the motion, that this level of detail is what comes into the policy recommendation that gets voted on today. That's all. Okay, otherwise I think we're, yes, thank you. Uh, so just as a point of clarification, um, that would be incorporated into recommendation number two. Yes. So recommendation number one, uh, based on Professor Hildreth's uh, amendment, would be ad adapted so that the date would be start as soon as possible, but no later than January 1st. Yes. The second recommendation would also incorporate the language from the ordinance into uh, the second recommendation. And then the third recommendation uh, will be dealt with separately. Is that correct? Yeah, that'd be the, the immediately following motion, right? Yeah. Okay. I think we got it. Uh, Mr. Hayes? No, I just want to say I'm comfortable with that, that approach because we always have the, uh, the option, if it's not implemented, we can go for the ordinance. So I'm comfortable with that, that approach. All right, I think we can vote on the motion now. All in favor of approving, I won't say it again, but all in favor of the motion that was just stated, <laughs> say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion passes. Yes, Mr. Goddard. I think I need to formally make a motion that um, the recommendation number three, the ordinance 
uh, we uh, under, that we understand that to be a recommendation um, to recommend that ordinance to Metro Council and we defer that until the December meeting. Okay, is there a second? I second. Uh, all in favor of deferring the third proposal to the December meeting, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That's probably something the chair could have done, but we were so deep into it, I wanted to have an <laughs> official motion. Thank you. Okay. Um, now I'll turn it over to Director Fitchard for the Executive Director's Report. Okay. All right. So this is October's report. I'm going to start this, and I'll take your questions um, as we go along. Um, the MNCO office will be closed on Thursday, November the 11th, in observation of Veterans Day. Um, the personnel update is we finished the community liaison interviews and the selection process is underway. We are in the process of interviewing um, for the MNCO administrative assistant position um, and we'll select a person once that's complete. We've interviewed three people so far in that particular, um, for that particular vacancy. Um, training, the MNC staff and um, multiple board, board members, by the way, participated in NACO's virtual annual conference training. That was 32 individual webinars. Um, the in-person component will include four days of training in Tucson, Arizona. That is December the 12th through the 16th. Um, if you want more information on how to register individually, just let me know. Um, um, the staff continue to take trainings um, online and where, whenever possible. Um, we try to have, um, you know, trainings in our office and talk about where we are and um, adjust to that as we um, have conversations about it. Um, I attended several trainings, Center for Police and Equity, Navigating Justice, um, and Mediators Beyond Borders International, their Peace Connect webinar, which is how unchecked biases influence our neutrality. Um, the Vision Zero Steering Committee, um, I attended that, um, and we actually um, talked about the elimination of traffic and pedestrian deaths. Um, there was a, that, that is going, and there's a survey online on Nashville.gov if you're interested in taking that to get your um, input and feedback regarding um, traffic and pedestrian deaths in Nashville. Um, I did want to say that we have a nomination committee and hopefully we can meet soon before the end of the year to talk about that process and how we can go, you know, move forward in selecting um, the new group of individuals to serve on the executive committee. Um, and we can set a date for that like, um, after the meeting. Um, if you haven't had your training, uh, let me know. They did post some November and uh, December dates for Metro's HR sexual harassment in a workplace training um, because you have to take that. It's mandatory. So if you haven't taken it, just give me a buzz and let me know and I'll get you registered. Um, also, um, the Citizens Police Academy is still underway. If you haven't taken that, which I think everyone has except for our newest member, um, then let me know. So I and I don't have the new dates for the spring yet, but I'm sure they'll be coming out soon. Um, as for community outreach, we have, um, well, Ms., uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Valier and myself will give a presentation to MMPD's lateral class, which is session 94. Um, that's gonna be on Monday, November the 15th about the history of the COB investigations, mediation and research. Um, and I participated as well as Dr. Valier um, earlier in the month. Um, I participated in Metro Human Relations Commission's discussion on reimagining public safety, um, community responsive policing that happened on Monday. Um, and that's posted on Nashville.gov, um, I'm sorry, on their YouTube channel, which is Metro Nashville, if you want to listen to that. It's, um, it's a, it, it was a really good conversation. Um, as for research, um, Dr. Valier and um, our other analyst, Gavin Williamson, uh, Crow continue to work on criminal justice advisory reports that address the current state of policing and criminal justice trends, patterns, and practices locally and nationally. Um, we know once this report is done, there's going to be more. I think you guys have suggested some, and they're working on some that were still outstanding, and we'll reveal those to you as time goes on and 
determine which ones are the, we should work on first. Um, complaints, we received a total of four investigative complaints since our last board meeting in September. We also received three complaints that were handled internally. Um, and so they didn't rise to the occasion of an investigation. For instance, um, so two of them were forwarded directly to MMPD for handling. So one of the complaints I'll tell you was um, at one of the metro buildings here, um, the uh, director of that had a complaint that officers were coming inside of that building and not wearing their mask. And so because of that, um, because of that, um, she um, it, it had an encounter and, it, and she said the officer was rude or whatever. So we just sent that on directly to them, but it was still a complaint and we hadn't been necessarily logging those the way that, you know, to make certain that we're getting a full circle and because it didn't rise to the occasion of an investigation, but it was something that we wanted them to handle eternally as a reminder to officers that, you know, this is a, ma there's a mask mandate and, you know, you need to wear your mask if you're in a government building. Um, and so we, I also received a complaint um, that was sent to some Metro Council members. And so we spent, well, Doc, um, I'm sorry, A.D. Clausey spent time after I sent it to him looking over it. Um, but it was nothing that we could really do to help this particular person um, because it happened, most of it, in another county. But we spent a, an, at least an hour or longer working on it, but it didn't rise to the occasion of an investigation. So I just, you know, we're, we're going to figure out a way to make certain that we're documenting those things because we're just, we're logging them, but they are complaints. We just sometimes aren't listing them in this report as an, because it's not an investigative complaint. So if you look at the four calls plus those three that's seven in the month instead of just four so we just got to get our reporting stuff you know really tight um, on that um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the budget I requested a meeting with our Metro Finance team to discuss where we are with our budget if you notice I handed that out to you um, as we talked about budgets one of my concerns was where we were because we're looking at the possibility of um, increasing our budget, um, asking for more FTEs in this new fiscal year. Um, I think it was in one of the meetings that Dr. Hildreth addressed like having a budget committee um, because it would be important for us to talk about where we are, what we need to do. I also wanted to meet with our Metro Finance team to get a clear understanding of how that process looks. You know, as we're talking about adding full, you know, full-time employees, like what's the process, where are we with our budget, you know. Um, of course, if you look at our budget there, where it says historic budget to actuals as of September 30th, this is where we are. Um, of course, um, I think the numbers are just, uh, I would say, slightly off. Um, but we, um, I mean, we just... We aren't really spending a lot um, in regards to um, our training and things of that nature as of yet, because of course the pandemic is still going on and a lot of trainings are online and not, you know, um, in person. So um, we, I think professional development is important through our office and we're working on that. We're, we're going to take training um, in NACO, which is, we have to, you know, we've all registered for that. But more so, you know, we don't have enough in our budget now to include an additional, um, an additional position because not only do you have to think about the salary, you have to have to include the fringe benefits. And they were saying, well, you could, if there was a possibility that you had enough in your in your budget now, you could add maybe one in this fiscal year. But we really don't have it unless we took something from another, you know, um, line in our budget to try to make up the difference. And so I think it's just best to wait until the spring comes and ask for the employees that we need. Um, and that I also needed to think of, if the more that we increase our staff, we have to think about space and the build out of that. And so I asked um, the assistant director to check on the space that we have at our office now that is connected to our, to our current office space. Um, and that is available. Um, and I did include that in the lease initially that we will <laughs> that space because I figured there would be some growth and expansion. Um, so that's available. Um, as we look at this budget, the page that you see beneath, so we have, we have 10 FTEs, which are full-time employees for our total department. Um, bless you. Um, the OPA budget, if you look on that that I attached, um, and I just, I'm using this, you know, for comparison to show you the differences in the budgets. 
Um, the OPA, this is from their budget book, and this is strictly for full-time employee staffing. They have um, 14 positions staffed. I don't know if they have all of those filled. Um, I believe they have most of those filled. Um, and so that's their budget. They were awarded out of, out of the police budget their budget, and this is for salaries only, this is not including, you know, day-to-day -day departmental to run an agency or department, their budget for full-time employees is 1.7. So I just wanted to make certain that you all saw that. Um, I did bring you copies of the police budget in totality if you want to take a look at that. Um, and I will pass that along to you. Um, so as time goes on, and I think it would be probably like we should be preparing for, to do this in January because they will start the budget process really quickly and we need to like figure out um, how many people we need. I definitely would like to talk about adding a social worker to our mix. Um, it wasn't considered initially, but I think it's important um, because of the kind of calls that I'm receiving. Um, and I think that having someone who has the training and the skills to deal with calls in, in people who are experiencing grief or experiencing, um, you know, mental, uh, mental health crises and a host of other things, I think that it would be helpful to have that position in our office. I did ask Assistant Director Clausey to kind of look into what the qualifications were for that and if we could really meet a salary, you know, to pay someone um, to do that within our, within our um, budget structure. So um, I'm going to move on to... Our proposed resolution reports. So I sent seven reports over to Chief Drake at the, the day after the, the last meeting. Um, he's, you know, responded. He's going to take those into consideration. We've had contact with the OPA director in regards to what she needed to be able to do their investigation. Um, and so those have went out. We know that there, I mean, that is seven, but there is a 45 day turnaround on that. They can request additional time if they need it. Um, and so we, we shall see what happens with those. Um, and of course we have three that I'll be presenting to you shortly. Um, we have been talking, I met with several mediators um, from the Mediators Beyond Borders International to discuss police and citizen, they call it the unification mediation. Um, it's specifically the police to peace model, which I have talked to you all about. It was a really good meeting. Um, they're, modeling, um, they're, they're modeling this particular unification um, program out of LA. It's already been incorporated in Los Angeles since 2014. Um, one, of the, one of the women on the call is trying to do the same thing in Greensboro, South Carolina. These would be pilot programs um, that would be, that they would help fund. Um, it um, is just specifically dealing with police and citizens um, and, and the mediator is local right, for local, but trained in this unification process. I, I think it's a fantastic idea. I'll give you more information as I get it. Um, I was connected with um, the city attorney out of Los Angeles County who has been running this program since 2014. Um, he, um, a little bit, well, what I was told in his from his resume, he was trained in mediation through Pepperdine University and he, um, I mean, he has a lot of knowledge about this, um, you know, this process of trying to um, have mediation between um, citizens and the police department in a real, um, in a real way where it's not just time constraints involved. If it takes two months, it takes two months. You know, there's no rush to get it done. And so it's, I think that that's been really successful in creating um, an understanding between this, you know, the community and the police that they have encountered with. So the more information I get, I'll share it with you. Um, we've been getting our records with no issues in October. Um, I went to a force review. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that, that comes up later. But the force review update, so I, 
of course, I talked to you all a couple of times about the new process or a process that we want to start implementing as it pertains to auditing force reports, you know, where there's use of force, those TBI investigations, because of number one, it takes a long time to get those back. You know, it's going to be past our time frames. Um, if we are getting it, so what happens is TBI gets it. I don't if they have 90 days. It, it takes 90 days and then we have to get it from the district attorney's office and so the process of auditing is something I think will move those along quickly and then um, I, I said well how do we do these audits to make certain that we are following um, some kind of guideline and what an audit looks like and so I asked Dr. Valier to look at the yellow book standards to determine if those would be appropriate for this particular process um, he did reach out to I want to say it was COPA or somewhere I think he reached out to Chicago um, through the inspector general yeah, it's Inspector General's office to get like a guideline um, so that we have some sort of official guideline in how we're doing these audits and we're just not, you know, we're, and hopefully we're not missing anything. And so he did get a response back. We did get some information that we will, you know, try to um, you know, scale down really um, to meet the need that we have um, because, of course, they are. Um, auditors, right? So that's a little different. Um, they're trained professional auditors. And so, but there was a lot of good material in there that we could create our own auditing process that I think would meet the needs that we want to make certain that we're meeting and that we're presenting to you information that makes sense. And that when we're doing an audit, we're not only necessarily just auditing the content of the investigation, but other um, portions of the reports as well. So you'll be hearing more about that as well. Um, there is a use of force hearing coming up. Um, it was scheduled. Oh, I went to the one in Thursday, October the 7th. Um, and then there's another one. It got postponed. It will be in November. And that would close out two um, use of force shootings, um, for I'm assuming, for the year. Um, so... Um, On Friday, October the 22nd, okay, you got the response. We talked about that. And so we also sent some requests to, um, to Commander Lara. Um, the license plate reader question um, that came from member Gooch was already included in a letter. Um, I sent a... Um, uh, a request for information for the MMPD CIT co-response pilot because we hadn't heard anything about that. That was in June the 28th is when it started. Um, so I sent it to um, the mayor's liaison, Ms. Diaz Cirillo, um, after I talked to Commander Lara, um, and her response was that um, there she uh, that court there's going to be a report that it's. The response that quarterly data is being prepared for the November 4th stakeholder council meeting and said that it may not be available for this meeting. I sent that to her last week. Um, and so I, I really don't know who's on that, who's part of that stakeholder council meeting, but I asked to be included since there is an email going out to these stakeholders. Um, we haven't been included in that weekly update. I haven't heard back to determine whether or not they will include me on that. Um, but but I do think it's important that we are included in the process through there um, to find out what's happening on there. Um, so I did ask um, Commander Lara to get some information for me in regards and in the in my report I sent to you. I wanted the total number of calls for assistance, the number of such calls that were diffused without police intervention, the number of calls that required active police intervention, such as detention and or arrest, and any other information deemed relevant for the effective evaluation of the response model um, and so the response that as of 10 16 the total number of calls for assistance was 1222 um, calls with mental health components 600 and the number of calls that required active police intervention such as detention and an arrest with 23 arrests and I'm assuming that's cumulative from June until October the 16th um, but 
I don't know until we get the information directly from them. Um, board member Holloway requested information regarding the demographic information um, of the last recruit training class and the current classes. Um, the recruit demographics questions, session 92, they, they graduated. The total number of males was 60. The total number of females was nine. Um, and the race, ethnicity by gender, there were 52 males, um, white, six black, two Hispanic, one Asian. Females, eight white, one black. Um, the percentage of those graduated by race or ethnicity, a total graduated was 50. Um, there were 94%, uh, 47 males and three females. The demographics is 40 male white graduated, three black males, three Hispanic males, and one Asian male, and three white females. Session 93, the total number of males was 24, the total number of females 14. There were 17 white males, five black, two Hispanic. There were 10 white females, three black, one biracial. Um, and in the total number, and that's a, that's that's an in session class right now. And then there's another session that's a lateral session. In that number, there's 15 males and two females, 10 white males, four black um, males, one Hispanic male, and two white females. So, uh, yeah, we should get some updates on that as time goes on. Um, I will attend a department head meeting tomorrow, October the 28th. I met with um, John Bunton a few times over this month, um, actually regarding the soft empty, the, the report, the policy advisory report, and just catching up on what's happening um, in some of his programs that he's working with, with um, Mr. Ron Johnson. Um, Dr. Valier and myself met with um, Dr. Stephanie Kong, um, the director of the Health Department's Health Equity Bureau, to discuss the possibility of some collaboration there. Um, I, I want to talk about that in conjunction with my survivor, um, I have on here, survivor resources. So I met with the MNCO leadership and the research team to discuss an endeavor that would assist complainants and the family of deceased individuals who have been directly impacted by police violence and deaths. The MNC research team is gathering data from around the country and searching for funding resources for this endeavor. Um, so in talking, I explained that also to um, Dr. Kong. So one of the things that I'm finding that's happening is the survivors of, 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 of individuals who have been shot and killed by the police are calling our office for updates on the case. They have been left without getting any information from either the DA's office, the TBI, MMPD. And so I'm, I'm receiving those calls. They're escalating a little bit. And the more that time goes on, grief-stricken parents and loved ones are calling, and they're saying, that they can't get any information, and they have lots of questions. Um, you know, they ask questions pertaining to the investigation. Well, you know, what happened here? No one is telling me. No one's taking my calls. And I think that we have a responsibility here um, to talk to the, the survivors and give them some answers so that they can get some closure in the death of their loved one. And it's, and it's not happening. Um, I had a call today, as a matter of fact, from a gentleman whose son was shot and killed by the police. And to listen to him and his grief it, in, in, in understanding his pain because he has no answers, no responses. And so it just builds up a lot of anger and animosity. Um, and they're left um, also not able, not being able to grieve through this process. So their loved one is buried, but the process hasn't ended for them. And so I think that also, you know, our office being able to connect them to the kind of resources that they need to deal with grief or depression, anxiety, or whatever thing that they may be experiencing is one part of this. The second part is I think that there has to be some responsibility from the agencies and the powers that be. The district attorney's office should sit down with these people and tell them what happened to their loved one and why they this process is closed if it's closed. And that's, I think, a, a very serious portion of this process that hasn't been addressed yet. Um, and there's a lot of anger um, from those loved ones, too, for sure, who call me weekly for updates. 
Um, and I don't think it's just our responsibility to handle that. I think that it should come from those who make the decisions not to prosecute or, you know, whatever, whatever decisions they've made to find out why they decided that this the, a shooting was justified. And as, as I explained to the parents of those who have been shot and killed, you know, our position is to look at it administratively. I can't tell you why it, uh, an officer or someone was in charge criminally, right? That's not my position position to do. And so I believe that that onus lays on the district attorney general's office. Um, and so I just wanted to just until like, I can take questions afterwards. We have our next meeting on November the 19th. That's a Friday and that's the only date that I could get. So I'm sorry, <laughs> your, your Friday is going to be kind of held up. And then on the next one in December is on a Monday. So that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Pritchard. Mr. Kelmagooch. 20th. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you for that, Director Fitcher. Uh First, I want to like commend you on taking those calls. I know those calls are, as someone who also gets those calls, those are uh, very difficult to hold. And it also feels like folks, the survivors that are calling you um, could also be plugged into survivor-led organizations like Moms Over Murder, um, and I know there's several different organizations on the ground. They may not be able to give folks direct information, but give them somebody to organize against. Um, and then I wanted to say, I think, and I, this comes from me attending city council meetings, uh, but city council member Porterfield is a city council member that is over the, um, the uh, sorry, I'm blanking, the, um, the November 4th, city council meeting that you mentioned on your report. Mm -hmm. um, so she's over that one. So that one might be a good thing to charge. And then I was curious about this. I know that MMPD gets their funding both from the capital improvement spending budget and the general, the general fund. At, if I'm reading this correctly, OPA gets all of their funding from the general fund or do we, do we know that or we don't? No. Um, OPA gets all of their funding from within the Metro Police Department's budget. Gotcha. Okay, and so my next question when it comes to, because I know the budget conversation is actually happening right now, um, is how many, with, with your current uptick in investigations and complaints and all of the things that the office is dealing with, ideally, how many employees would you need to be able to capture all of it? And I mean, the referring people to other services, uh, following up with folks, being able to deliver investigations in a timely manner, or just like whatever it, you think is the best timing, down to being able to do the PP, uh, the uh, resolution reports really quickly. Like a total number, ideally, how many folks, uh, full-time employees, for, for this budget, for this budget year, or just in general? Just in general. Just oh, okay. Ideally. Oh, I, th I definitely think we need about six new people, six to eight. Um, I, I, we definitely need at least three to four investigators. Um, we need one social worker. We'll need a, another research assistant. Um, I, I anticipate that we would need a um, um, someone that like a legal assistant um, and. <laughs> um, m more than one research person, so I would say two of that, and that would give us like that total that I need. And what? And what? I know you said six to eight more. What would be that? I'm sorry, my math is crazy. What would be that total number of employees? Six, seven. That would be seven. Okay. Well, no, eight because we would need. Uh, I think that we could have another person that runs with. So we have a so we have a community liaison, and then what we need is a public information person. So okay. that would be a, a total of eight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wynn. Th thank you for the, your report, Director. I, I, um, your idea about a social worker as a staff member, I think it's kind of unique. And, and, and let me offer you the suggestion. Um, First, the, the DA's office is a victim uh, witness coordinator. Mm -hmm. All of them do. Uh, and they 
often are tasked with dealing with the unanswered questions from homicide survivors, and I've worked with a lot of those over the years myself, about unanswered questions or justifications for dropping cases. They usually do that, but they're not social workers, but they're trained to understand how to direct people to the right person to talk to if they are grieving. Mm -hmm. uh, Metro's unique in that we've got a family safety department. They're, this is something that's been unique in all governments in the country. Diane Lance is director, and she has a staff of social workers who work for her at the Family Safety Center mm -hmm. and the G. Crow Center at the courthouse. Uh, on top of the VIP counselors at the police department who work with homicide survivors. My suggestion would be for you and staff to reach out to Diane and ask her her opinion on how to um, design a program for the COP to have a social worker to deal with this gap in the system where they can't get answers because it was a, a, a police-involved incident uh, and people step away from it because they don't consider them victims, and they are. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing, too, th there may be some funding availability. You know, the, the burn grants uh, out of the Justice Department may allow you to hire a social worker. The COPS grants may do it, and the OVW grants possibly. So there could be federal money there for, for you to hire a social worker do this work, but I think it's a I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Uh, having, having worked with homicide survivors, who you couldn't, as an investigator, tell them why this case wasn't taken forward to the grand jury or was dropped, because um, those are answers for for the for the prosecutor. But a social worker could could ease that pain a little bit. And and you know, and, and you mentioned closure. I don't really think there's such a thing, actually. I mean, right. we say it, but I mean. Right. I don't think there's ever a closure people who've lost a loved one, no matter what the circumstances are. Right. So good luck I with it. I, I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Mr. Witzel. Oh, yeah, I, just, I was going to say uh, the same thing. I think it's a great idea. Um, I also wanted to know if uh, with the positions that um, you said that we needed, what, which ones would you prioritize um, it, for the next budget season? Uh, the, definitely the investigators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think that we should ask um, for at least two um, or more. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, but I mean, just to be fiscally responsible, I think that I would, I would definitely prioritize the investigators. I think that we also need um, once we get our social, I'm, I'm sorry, my um, community liaison hired. I, I've been thinking about that position in itself because we have put so many things in that um, when this position was hired, I'm sorry, when it was being created, we have them being the PIO, the media person, the, you know, this, the, this, and that. And I think those duties could be split up. And so having a person who responds to media only um, and sets that stuff up and does all of the um, the, uh, the the interactions with the media and the news, I think, would be great. And then, so that might be on our list. But, you know, but for certain, we need more investigators, which means that we need more space. I mean, when initially, when we got the space, it's there's only 10 offices in there, and one of them is an investigation room. Um, so, you know... There, there was some space that we could have had at the at the moment, but the the um, other executive director um, didn't, you know, open it up that much. Maybe because of cost, I don't know. Um, but they did preserve that space for us, or you know. So, um, and we, I had, um, I asked um, AD Clausey to contact the building to see what it would take and what the cost would be, so that I could present that to you all um, to to. Um, to outfit that office space. Um, and they said that they would absorb the cost of the build out. Um, it, and then we would have to extend our lease, of course. So I hope that answered your question. I'm yes, sorry, I started you. rambling. No, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Mr. Kamaguch. Yeah, I, I did. And then I, I also wanted, I wanted to give voice really fast to the folks that are calling you, because some of those folks are directed that way. And it was literally because they didn't feel comfortable with calling anyone else. Um, and I just wanted to hold that, that the COB of the board, the staff is seen as neutral completely, um, or if not neutral, on the side of the people. So with that being said, I feel like as we grow and as we become a more dependable institution, those calls are only going to multiply. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense for the COB to have its own social work 
or community organizing team that their sole purpose is to follow up with folks uh, that have been harmed mm -hmm. by MMPD and guide them through healing and maybe even plug them into organizations that work on that. Right. Um, and then I also, in my next comment is for the board members or chair, I noticed that on the agenda, we don't have a specific time allotment for the license plate reader thing. So I'm trying to figure out when would be the best time to bring it Yes, up. I brought it up during my chair remarks. Um, you weren't here for that, but we can continue discussing it at the end. Dr. Hildreth. Thank you. Um, Director Fitcher, incredibly detailed report. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the holistic breadth of subjects that you um, covered. But coming back to the budget with specificity, what assistance do you want from the board at this point in moving forward, either with a budget committee or work assignments? We are all cognizant of the fact that this is a um, scheduled and unforgiving timeline mm -hmm. as the government system moves forward. How do you suggest we um, best support you and your staff in this effort? Yeah, I think having a committee, um, you know, would be very helpful to, to work through the budget process this year since we are going to be asking for more, like we're going to be asking for more money through getting our build out and space and employees. So I think that maybe nominating, um, I don't know how that process works, but if we can have people volunteer to be on the committee, that would be great. So that when we have that meeting, we can present to you the, 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 the data to support some of the initiatives that we want to have. And I do think that we can um, uh, get information regarding our budget. We have that readily accessible, but information as it pertains to getting funding and bud budget money or grants um, is a separate thing. And but we want to also present that to you, in the, because it'll be a part of a budget as well. Um, because if we have, you know, as I think about it now, as we think about um, having a grant, we might have to have a grant manager on, you know, so. Um, I think having a committee would be the best way. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, in your dual capacity as being one of the founding creators of the bylaws, um, what is the direction that you would give us in terms of what kind of motion would be needed, or do we already have a structure that would um, give us the capacity to create this committee, uh, receive volunteers, and begin the work now? I think I can just create the committee. Um, so I'll take any volunteers to serve on the budget committee. I volunteer. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. I'd love to be on it. And Hayes. Mr. Hayes and Mr. Kamalbuch. Anyone else for the moment? If not. Um, I guess I'll leave it to you, Director Fitcher, to schedule a time with them. Sure. Thanks. Um, Thank you all. Any other discussion on the executive director's report? If not, we can move on to our legal advisor. I don't like to talk for a long amount of time, um, but I was asked to do this presentation. Um, I was happy to do it, um, but I wanted it to be short and effective. I timed it earlier, and it's about 10 minutes. Um, I sincerely believe that the reason it is so long-winded is because lawyers are not taught to be short and effective. We're taught to be verbose and confusing. So I am relying on the board members. If I can ask of you after this meeting, if you can give me feedback on this presentation, tell me what was effective, what hit home, and tell me what wasn't. Um, and that will make my job as your legal advisor better so that you can do your job on behalf of the community uh, more effectively. So this presentation is three parts. It's 13 slides and should take no longer than 10 minutes. Um, the three parts are first, what has happened so far? How did we get here with the proposed resolution reports? Um, what goes into its creation and preparation? Part two, what happens after the board receives it when the director is giving her presentation? Um, what are the rules and prohibitions governing the board's discussion and what actions can they take? And then finally, part three, what happens next? After a proposed resolution report is submitted and approved to a resolution report, 
who does it go to, and what kind of responses can you expect? So part one is, in the beginning, we receive a complaint. This complaint can be anonymous or from a person who, on behalf of themselves or someone else, uh, wants to allege misconduct against an MNPD employee. Um, we can also have the director self-initiate a report, and this can be started by one of the board members yourselves requesting that. The complaint is then investigated. An intake process is established to decide, do we have jurisdiction to even hear this? Um, further investigation by way of interviewing potential witnesses, uh, letters and notifications are sent out pursuant to Civil Service Commission rules and other due process safeguards. This investigative report that is compiled at the conclusion of it will contain confidential information. If we can add a little click. Yeah. And that confidential information has to remain confidential. Um, the investigative report is given to the director and myself. We review it and we create after reviewing the primary source material by way of the exhibits, the recorded interviews, um, the proposed resolution report. And we go to the next slide. That proposed resolution report, the beautiful thing that you're going to be looking at later in the meeting uh, three times, um, does not have confidential information included in it. It is published online. It is available to the public. Um, the only thing we redact initially are the complainant's names and the officers who were involved names. That information is later put back in um, after it becomes the resolution report. The next slide. This is the most legally boring part of the presentation. The board will review each proposed resolution report applying a standard of presumption of correctness unless the preponderance of the evidence is to the contrary. We will define both of those terms. Next slide. Presumption of correctness. Oh, I'm sorry. The reason we even use these legal standards is because this is not a trial. Um, there is no presumption of innocence uh, on the part of the MNPD employee. Um, the director doesn't carry a burden of proof when she's presenting these uh, reports to you, as she will later on. This is something you would see in a criminal or civil trial, for example. And that is because the due process safeguards that are already included in the administrative investigation that is conducted takes that into account. And also because, in part, you will not be sentencing anyone to jail or describing any punishment to anyone at the conclusion of your uh, decision making. You are referring the recommended actions in the report to the chief of police, to the grand jury, or to a district attorney for the state or the federal government. Um, so because of these actions and uh, because of the administrative processes that are already implemented, we use these different standards and we go through a different process. So the presumption of correctness is simply all of the factual conclusions and allegations in the report are assumed to be true. Um, you don't have to decide anything unless, and that's the second legal definition, the preponderance of the evidence in the report is to the contrary. So if the majority of the board believes that it is 51% likely, or more likely than not, that one of the conclusions that the director has put in is not true, then you can disregard it and you can come up with a different conclusion. But all of this is going to be based upon the evidence presented in the report, not the, well, did you investigate that? Did you not investigate this? Um, that is sometimes in the investigative report and not put in the proposed resolution report, but it is something that you are assumed has gone on. That doesn't mean you leave your questions and your experiences and common sense at the door either. You absolutely should and, and would do that. Are there any questions so far? I just want to check in because this is the most legalese part of the uh, presentation, and I just want to leave time for that if there are any. Seeing none, um, next slide is, and we'll go to the next slide too. These are the four actions that you have already done and that you will continue to make. You can make one of four actions. One is you can accept it. The proposed resolution report now becomes the resolution report. It's sent to all of the agencies identified in the report that they will be going to. It will also go to the complainant and the officers. The second action is you can accept but modify. And this is really intended for findings of fact changes or 
recommended actions changes. This is not intended to make modifications as to the director's conclusions of the allegations. Again, using a lot of legalese here, but sustained, not sustained, unfounded. These are the legal, uh, these are the conclusions from the director as to the uh, specific uh, allegations. And that's really reserved for part three. Action number three is labeled rejection, but isn't really, <laughs> or isn't uh, the way that I use rejection sometimes. Rejection is, based on the information in the resolution report, the board reaches a different conclusion than the director. So the only modification that will be made in a rejection is to the, those allegations. We're changing something from sustained to unsustained, director. Director, we're changing something from unfounded to just not sustained. Any other type of modification will be in action number two. Action number three still results in a resolution report as modified, and it is still sent to all of the agencies identified, and there's no further action taken by the board. We know what the modifications are going to be, and there's no need to reconsider uh, or send it back to the Metro Nashville Community Oversight staff. And that's action number four. Action number four is called a return, similar to, again, what I would consider sometimes a rejection. Take it back to the MNCO for further analysis or for further investigation, and then this will come back to the board at a later time as a new proposed resolution report. So those are the four actions that you all have been making and that um, you're authorized to take. Worth mentioning again, the investigative report is confidential. All of you as board members are um, welcome and encouraged at times to review it at the MNCO office so that you can do your jobs uh, as stewards for the community and representative capacities um, to do it well. Because when we do these public meetings, we unfortunately cannot reveal some of the confidential information contained in that report, but we don't want to give any uh, sense of that we're trying to hide something. So. Balancing that line between transparency with we have to keep state secrets secret. Um, what happens next? After the resolution report is um, created, we send it to the chief of police, we send it to the Office of Professional Accountability, and the chief of police is required to respond in writing. Um, after 10 calendar days, um, the names are unredacted from the report. Everybody's name goes back into it. Because within that 10 calendar day period, the Civil Service Commission and due process require that the individuals be allowed to uh, petition to reconsider, not unlike an appeal. That petition to reconsider will only be granted in two circumstances. One is that there's newly uh, discovered evidence. This isn't evidence that was always out there, always available, and they just sat on it and didn't want to submit it. This is actually newly discovered evidence. And the second reason would be there's been a, a procedural, substantial procedural error in the process. We didn't do what we uh, said we were going to do. We uh, did know about a witness and just didn't uh, think it was material to, to interview them. Um, apart from that, the resolution report becomes um, final. Uh, still subject to appeal, but that's already been addressed by Chair Martinez. Um, and that concludes my presentation. There is also a two-page quick reference guide that the director uh, sent out to everyone in an email, but we're happy to provide it again. And similarly, if it's helpful, let me know that, please. If it's not helpful, let me know that as well so that I can um, do better. Thank you, Mr. Yoon. Dr. Hildreth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yoon. That was a great presentation. I do have a question about the public access to the proposed PRRs. I remember when we were here on special session two weeks ago, um, the director sent us a board members a link, and the link actually went to the repository that was public. I have since tried to find that looking on the website, and I have my computer up right now, and it does not matter when I go to nashville.gov if I am searching for the Community Oversight Board, which is us 11 people, or MNCO, which is the staff. So having two different portals, um, that'll be another comment. <laughs> Great. On either one now, I don't see where the click to that PRR repository is. Um, I'm at the 
Community Oversight Board now, there's services and there's a click to file a police complaint. So I guess that's the first slide of your presentation. There's a button right next to it to recommend police commendation. So nice balance. And then there's something that goes to all Metro Community Oversight Services, but it still doesn't get to where we're going. There's the hotline, there's events and meetings, there is news, there's related board and commissions. Then there are related police department links, um, the police department manual, crime statistics, accreditation of the police department, and CALEA. All good information and important. But I'm not finding how if I'm a member of the public or even a member of the board who's trying to do their homework, where this public information is. Am I missing something or are, is the design inaccessible to the public right now? I'm going to let um, um, Dr. Valier, I mean the website is difficult to navigate since they changed it, but I'll let him talk about the, yes, you can find it. Uh, so what I was going to say is, is the navigation on the website has become more challenging since the redesign. Um, on that page, there's a navigation meant button that has to be clicked. Oh, the little red thing. The little red button, top. and under okay. the proposed resolution reports uh, drop okay. down on there, there's a there's a window that pulls data from data.nashville.gov, which is the okay. open data portal, okay. which is where we store all of the links to the proposed resolution reports and resolution reports, as well as responses from the chief of police. Um, I, I will say that the uh, navigate, we have heard that the navigation, we've had several people um, provide feedback that they have had challenges navigating the new website. Um, so if I can make the recommendation, if we're not able to have that design changed, then just as it was extremely helpful to me and I hope to the public to hear Mr. Yoon's pre short presentation right now, may I request that at the next board meeting we have a similar PowerPoint with a click by click so we can see. And this is really important because these meetings are taped. And I spoke to a community member yesterday at the council meeting that I talked mm -hmm. about for the license plate readers. And this community member indicated to me that they are now involved in a community of community folks who have watch parties. So there are people who are watching us live right now and following what's going on. And we want them to see as much of the redacted PRR as possible. And it really absolutely frustrates our core and foundational intention to be transparent and available to the community. If the folks at home can't play along, then we're just becoming another part of the problem. And I don't think we showed up here to do that. So, um, and I know that getting webmasters and websites and policies with business, that is sometimes impossible. So the next best thing would be we have to have a public teach-in that will be on this record and in the YouTube queue so that folks can know how to find that. So thank you for allowing me to take the time to make that comment. Ms. McCree and then Mr. Kemmel Gooch. I just want to remind everyone that it's 545 almost and we still have three PRs yes, to get sir. to. Thank you, Chair. I'll be brief. Um, in addition to Ms. Hildreth's comment, I would like to see, I know we are waiting, maybe it's a staffing issue with the social media piece, but if we could have those reports, a lot of people who are not watching the meeting still want to know what's going on. Um, and so if we, if we can get a link posted to the Twitter, a lot of the information I try to share from there, if we can get some stuff on Facebook and other social media platforms where it's common knowledge for people to have easy access to this information, I think it would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, we can do that. I, I, I noticed that, you know, when once um, Facebook changed a lot of their, um, what do you say, it, algorithms? It's, you know, I'm not getting the same amount of people. They want you to pay for, you know, that information now and, you know, advertise to boost your page. Because we used to get, like, we had a good number of followers on Facebook, and now it's, like, dwindled down to, like, the same two people. Um, so if you all have Facebook, 
pages, please interact and continue to interact so that maybe your friends will interact as well um, so that we can keep that momentum going. Um, but yeah, we will definitely do that, um, Board Member McCree. Uh, I'll keep it brief. I, I also had another suggestion that's a, a simple one, I think. Um, if, if, if the staff can just collect folks' emails and then just email them out all the agenda items, kind of like similar to what we get, I think that'll just that it helps speed it up even faster. Just co just collect emails and just send out the same email that we get with the agenda with the items on it. Just attach it to an email and send it to folks. Um, and that could just be like a basic call, join our email list. Thank you, Mr. Kamaguch. Um, let's start with the first PR and Director Fitchard. All right, thank you. So the first PR is MNCO complaint, I'm sorry, MNCO um, CC 2020-012. It's an audit report of an OPA investigation regarding an incident that occurred in April, on April 9, 2020. Um, the complainant was nannying for three minor children ages seven, five, and three years old when a captain with the MMPD is alleged to have started an altercation between him and one of the children. The complainant alleged that the captain cursed at her and the children, played loud music that included offensive language, and threatened to turn on a sprinkler system in order to make the complainant and the children leave from a community bike path. In total, the OPA sustained three policy violations and discipline him with 11 uh, days suspension in total. Um, in total, the OPA sustained those. They sustained condu conduct unbecoming an employee of the department, a Category C offense, six-day suspension. Profanity, a Category E offense, three-day suspension aggravated due to the presence of the children. And number three, adherence to policy and rules regarding time accounting, a Category D offense, disciplined with two-day suspension. We found no deficiencies with the OPA's findings and conclusions with regard to these three policy violations. However, the MNCO did find deficiencies in the OPA's failure to find five additional policy violations, as well as the recommended disciplinary action. Um, we found, number one, discourtesy, a, a Category F violation. Um, number two, self-control, a Category D violation. Number three, devoting time to duty. There was no category specified in the manual. Number four, lack of professionalism. There's no category specified in the manual. And most significantly, false statements, a Category AA violation, the highest category violation for which dismissal is the disciplinary action. A video recording of the incident was made by the complainant on her phone shortly after the captain begins cursing at the complainant. It. This video was widely shared on social media and reported on in the news. On the video, the captain is clearly heard saying, ASS, <laughs> F-U-C-K-I-N-G, F-U-C-K, and S-H-I-T. He is also heard saying that he would turn on the sprinklers in response to the complainant saying she'd stay on the community bike path as long as they wanted. The captain admitted in his OPA interview that the recording was, factual, was a factual account of the incident, that he did use profanity, and that he violated policy regarding conduct unbecoming of an employee of the department. There is no dispute that the captain violated policy with regard to cursing, conduct, unbecoming, discourtesy, self-control, and a lack of professionalism. According to the interview with his supervisor and timekeeping documents, the captain was working from home that day. Um, if the captain were not working at all, then he would have needed to let his assistant know. Um, the evidence shows the assistant was not notified that the captain would not be working from home that day. The supervisor also remembered speaking specifically with the captain that morning, and it was his belief and expectation that the captain was working that the day that this incident occurred. Following the incident, although Captain wrote a letter of apology and during the disciplinary proceedings with OPA and MNCO and expressed regret and contrition, the ED finds that he lied about his status as not working on two separate occasions to investigators. First, he said he was not working at all in his initial interview. 
Um, and then again, when confronted with his timesheet on the follow-up interview, um, the captain doubled down and said that while he may have been working in the morning, he was not working later in the day. He claimed that he had just not informed anyone. The OPA found that this was a policy violation by way of not recording his time properly. The MNCO, however, finds that the captain's statement to the investigators on both of these occasions violate the MNPD policy regarding false statements. Captain supervisor explained that the captain was working from home that day and that he specifically remembered speaking to captain that morning. It was the supervisor's belief and expectation that the captain was on the clock. That is also what is reflected on the timesheets. If the captain were not working later in the day, policy dictates that the captain would have notified the assistant in order to inform the supervisor and someone else would be put in charge of his responsibilities. No notification was given and no replacement was appointed. For these reasons, the executive director, I find that the captain violated MNPD on giving false statements, which was a category AA, and I recommended the following that although the captain retired after this investigation, based on the sustained allegations in this report, an, an eligible and ineligible for rehire letter be submitted to Metro Human Resources and maintained in the captain's HR and MMPD personnel file. Um, we uh, assume that the captain retired in good standing, um, but I, I believe that the captain should not be rehired if, in fact, that was ever an option for him. And that is the end of that. Thank you, Director Fitchard. Any questions? Mr. Kambaguch. Is there a time limit for that? If, if somebody is marked unhirable? With Metro, is that a time limit? Does that ever expire? No, I don't think there is. Mr. Hayes. Okay, I see. The, okay, the incident occurred on April the 10th. Uh, how long did it take OPA to give them any type of discipline? Are you asking when their um, when when their um, investigation was complete? So he would not have been disciplined at all. I'm, I'm saying this, this occurred on the 10th. It was a video that was out there for the public. And I, I think I saw it pretty close to the time that it happened. And how long did it take them? Because I see where they, they did do some discipline here. Yeah. But when did that occur? Um... I, I, they moved pretty swiftly on this case. I don't have the dates in front of okay. me, but they did but move. Yeah, good. yeah, they did move pretty swiftly on this okay. one. And that is because, of course, it was all over the media. Right. Right. So that's, yeah, they moved okay. pretty quickly and on that. There is a concern uh, that they only, they only saw three violations, and then the COB saw eight violations. So why do you think that is? Is that, is that what's referred to as the blue wall? Is that what? Um, I don't know why it is. I, I mean, I, I, I noticed that um, in a, several of these that their violations um, aren't um, as, that there are some that are missing, but I, have, I, I, I can't speak to that. Thank you. Mr. Holloway. Uh, I feel very uh, confident that that letter rehire should be uh, taken out of there because that's the problem when you've got bad product and go from one agency to another agency. And so what we fail to do, we fail to recognize something from an employee that has happened in another agency. And uh, so with that letter put in a rehire, it's just like a slap on the back. It's just like giving him a reward. I know he was disciplined, you know, but if he a lie, he'll steal. And uh, my thing is I hope to take the letter out of his file. The rehire letter. So this letter is that he could not be hired. Oh. I'm sorry. Okay. That is correct. That, that's the proper thing to do. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Kamaguch. Uh, I move to accept. Second. Thank you. Any more focused discussion? All in favor of accepting the recommendation, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Director Fitchard. Thank you. All right, moving on to 
MNCO CC 2020-035. On January 7, 2021, the MNCO received a complaint from the complainant regarding the MMPD's handling the investigation into the death of her son on May 5, 2020. Um, in this particular report, the complainant alleges that the officer investigating her son's death failed to adhere to policy and rules regarding the evidence procedures and follow-up responsibility, as well as being deficient in the performance of his duties. We sustained uh, th the three allegations. Our investigation concluded that on May 25, 2020, um, the complainant's son was found deceased by an apparent overdose by his father in the deceased department after the family had not heard from him within 24 hours. The officer was the person who was responsible for investigating her son's death. The officer arrived on the scene that day, spoke to the father and the deceased brother, and gave them his information. The complainant, who was out of state, spoke to the officer three days afterward to ask about the investigation and inquired as to whether the officer had her son's phone. The complainant did not believe that it was a suicide. She believed that it was something, some, it, she believed that it was someone giving her son harmful narcotics without his knowledge or without him knowing the full extent of what they were. On May 29, 2020, four days after her son's death, she, she, um, the complainant specifically asked if the officer would be going through her son's phone, to which the officer replied, probably unlikely. When asked if the officer would be going through to see who her son was in contact with and where he got the stuff from, the officer responded, we generally do not try to investigate overdose, overdose deaths beyond whether it was a murder. The complainant asked, you don't go after those people? I was hoping y'all could look into it. The officer responded, there's no indication that is gonna occur. Contact me later. On August 3rd, 2020, the complainant follow, followed up with the officer about the prosecution of the people who gave the drugs that killed her son, and the officer informed her that, to my knowledge, the DA's office, the district attorney's office, does not feel it is something that is prosecutable. The cells, of course, are criminal, but another unit, the crime suppression unit, investigates that, and they will decide if they have time for it and whether it is a priority. The complainant said she believed her son was intentionally poisoned. The officer replied, I don't think that. I don't know that. I'm not a drug guy, so the whole conversation is a little beyond my depth. Later on that same day, the officer informed the complainant that neither the crime suppression unit nor the DA's office would be pursuing a drug or homicide investigation, and that we have reached the end of the line as far as the investigation goes. Ultimately, the case was reassigned by the precinct commander on August 17, 2020, to another detective. That detective reached out for camera footage, was informed it was only available for two weeks. That detective also submitted a search warrant for extraction of cell phone data, but was told not much was able to be gathered after 72 hours. In this case, it had been more than three months. The newly assigned detective was interviewed and informed the MNCO investigator that overdose cases are investigated by MNPD and that she believes searching through the cell phone in an apparent overdose case was best practice. From the investigative report and exhibits, I concluded that allegations one and two are both adherence to policy rules, category D offenses. I sustained both in that the officer failed to follow policy related to evidence procedures and follow-up investigation. Allegation three, deficient or inefficient performance of duties, a category offense that varies according to the, sever the severity of the of offense. I likewise sustained. The officer had no relevant disciplinary history. Category D offenses are typically disciplined between one and four day suspension. I recommend a one day suspension for each allegation for a total of a three day suspension. And that's the conclusion of that report. Thank you, Director Pritchard. Mr. Wynn. I'm gonna to try to make this short if I can. So forgive me if I go over a little bit. Um, that's okay. And I'm not questioning your staff and you investigating this case. I, I do have some questions, and this, this came up in the last month when we saw the, the commander got a few days where his subordinates got the rank stripped in the search warrant incident that, that you all investigated. So I hope I don't see a pattern here. Um, case management is pretty structured. If you're assigned a case by a supervisor, they're responsible for managing that case. I saw nowhere in the report 
where the detective's sergeant reviewed the clearance of this case. So this, the detective had to clear this case. Was it cleared? And why did the precinct commander take over individual supervision of a detective in a case like this when it should have been a lieutenant or a sergeant making those decisions? Uh, and look, I, anytime somebody says you've got a suspicious death and tells you I'm a relative, I think this person's been killed, this is a homicide case. This is a homicide investigation. Never mind the prosecutor's office. Uh, was this detective, the officer, a homicide investigator? And was, why was it not assigned to homicide? So I've got other questions about other people's accountability, about supervising this officer. So I'm, I'm kind of getting to this point. You know, we can judge these officers' behaviors, and we should, and that's our job to do that. But at what point do we take a look at the individual responsibility of the supervisors in managing these cases and officers? A good supervisor would have kept this officer out of trouble by reassigning it or talking to this victim themselves and providing the information they needed when they didn't get it. So, I, I, again, I've, I've got, I don't mean to be scattershot with this, but I just have a problem when we discipline an individual officer and the supervisor seems to stand away from accountability. And that, if you've got that, then you've got... You know, you've got individual officer discretion of 1,300 individual officers without any accountability. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that that is um, a discussion that we should have. Like maybe there are others who should be held accountable as well and not justice officer. Um, I will say that as I listen to the recordings of the officer, I do think that, and, and, and this is, you know, as you're listening to the, you know, the, the people on the phone calls, that I think that the officers, in fact, could have done more. He, it was just five minute conversations with the person. Um, and so, you know, I think that he should be held accountable, but I also think that we can go forward and look and see, and you can reject this, and we can go back and determine whether or not the sergeant who was uh, involved slightly should be held accountable as well. And can, can I add one other thing? It, sure. It, uh, I mean, you have to picture what this looks like. You've got a supervisor that manages multiple cases, mm -hmm. decides which detective to sign it to, and then requires that detective, and this is all structured in the SOP of each one of these investigative divisions, that they return to that investigator after a certain amount of time to give them a decision on what should be done. It should be infounded, it should be cleared, it should be cleared by exception. There's no evidence. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to clear cases, but that is a, that's in a process that, that, that has to be there mm -hmm. to manage complex cases like this. And I, don't, I didn't see it in this case. Was there any explanation? About no, why the supervisor uh, didn't make some decision on this case, that, that the commander of the station had to intervene. That's not usual, by the way. So, the, let, let, so for clarity purposes, the commander, what the detective stated was that the commander made the decision that they weren't investigating these types of cases. That was the allegation. The, the, the complainant, which is the mother of the decedent, she sends an email directly to the commander to say, like, why hasn't anything been done with this? Um, and at that moment, um, you know, at some point, the commander responds in an email to her and reassigns it to a, the, the new detective. At that point, we're talking about three to six months out. Um, so if there was any um, evidence, uh, and there was, I mean, I, I, looking at the crime scene, there was enough um, of a narcotic substance that should have been tested um, and could have been tested. Um, but so even, even once the, the ME's report came back um, and, you know, and stated that the death, you know, which is a, a public records report, I mean, that report is public, that this was a case of um, fentanyl poisoning, um, then um, at that point, trying to get any information off of the, off of the video um, or off of the telephone at that point was no longer um, 
viable. They, they couldn't they couldn't get it. And so, yeah, I mean, maybe there is, um, and we can go back if you want, and we can look at that stuff and add it. Um, we can also, um, we can do two things. We can accept this and discipline the officer for the lack of work that was done. And also we can, or send it back and let us include the sergeant if there is there something there, um, we can find that. It, it's, um, is that, a, is that, a, is that, is that how that probably would work? Or maybe I'm mixed up with that. I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Yoon, if you're ready. OK. Um, Mr. Holloway, and then Judge Brown, and then Mr. Kamelgooch. We are often sometimes uh, play high priority on certain cases. And it depends on the, on the neighborhood. And don't get me wrong on that. Um, they put more emphasis on different cases. And this might just happen to be one of them. And uh, you treat them all the same, do your best as you possibly, possibly can. And so whatever we need to do on this, is we need to go back and see what the role that the supervisor played in this. And uh, we, can do, we can do that also. Judge Brown. I guess my main concern in looking at this is why the drugs that were available there weren't tested. I mean, if this is simply oxycodone and an overdose, that's one thing. But apparently when they finally got around to testing it six months later, mm -hmm. it's got fentanyl. That is that is a case that the U.S. Attorney would, I guarantee you, would be dose prosecute. And I'm satisfied the district attorney would too. So, I mean, that to me was the initial fault of the initial officer in not doing that which was required. And that that would have determined whether it was a, an overdose, which probably would not be further investigated. Or, But if it's got fentanyl, that's a, crumb, that's a clear criminal act and should be uh, investigated to the fullest extent possible to determine who who was providing it. We we see those cases prosecuted every day by both federal and state authorities. So that to me is the the basic initial deficiency, but it also seems to uh, be a concern that there was at least some indication from the initial detective, uh, initial officer that uh, would be disciplined in this case, that uh, the instructions from higher up were we don't mess with these cases, uh, and if that's accurate, then that that requires an investigation of the supervisors as to what the policy was. I, uh, it just uh, this was a botched case. There's no 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 way of getting around of it. But I think the question is is raised is that uh, we need to look higher because disciplining the individual officer is may be appropriate, but it also, we need to look at what's going on at a higher level. I mean, why is the officer under the impression that this is something that's not going to be prosecuted? And so, okay, don't bother with sending the drugs off for testing. Don't bother with uh, checking the phone. Don't bother with uh, checking any uh, video that would have been available of the, uh, apparently, of the apartment. So I, I tend to agree that... Uh, I don't disagree with the discipline of the officer, but I think there's a, I think it's like the iceberg. I think there's a lot more underneath here that uh, needs to be looked at. Mr. Kamelgooch. Yeah, I'm also just like echoing the sensitivity of this be, being a pattern, um, but we have a commanding off, officer not doing their duty. So I do have a motion to offer, which is, um, if I think, if, if, if I remember it correctly, it's a motion to reject so that the uh, MSCO staff can go back, do the investigation uh, about the higher ups, and then deliver us a thorough recommendation. I second that motion. Thank you. Any focused discussion on that, Dr. Hildreth? Thank you. I, my comment will lead right into the focused discussion. I'm inclined to vote in favor of that motion um, with the request that staff go back and look at the incident and supervision, but I think that there is a larger comment here beyond the motion of 
as we are developing our own SOPs about how we do this, um, does the pattern we have detected and the commentary we've heard from our board members indicate that we are asking staff always to investigate the presenting incident and to also investigate the chain of command and supervision decisions that may have led to or exacerbated the presenting incident. So my first thinking was, um, and I noticed this is a CC, so I guess that CC uh, community complaint, mm -hmm. okay, because others, when they're D, they're director. Mm -hmm. It may be that the community is always going to be complaining about what Officer Friendly did when she showed up and did something. Mm -hmm. So the CC might always be about the incident, but it's almost like mm -hmm. we need to have an inherent director's investigation of supervision. So um, mm -hmm. I guess that was my focus discussion, and I am speaking in support of the motion on the table. Thank you. Mr. Hayes. I just want to say that I'm, I'm really glad that people feel comfortable coming to the COB because just thinking about grief and what that parent was going through and, and the runaround that they got on this particular incident is it's just unheard of. But I'm, I'm just glad that people feel that they have a place to come in the COB. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Hayes. Any more focused discussion on the motion? Mr. Wynn. Just one thing to add to the, this conversation. The differential treatment of supervisors' behavior in the ranks of a police department demoralizes the subordinates in that agency. If the officers know that their supervisors get less punishment than they get, they're less likely to walk in to their office, their supervisor's office, and make a complaint about misconduct. So and I know this is not responsibility of this board to deal with the morale of the police department, but it matters for officers to know that they're going to be treated as fairly as anybody else who does the same thing, no matter what the rank is. I thought I'd add that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. Mr. Yoon. Just a quick response. I was asked about what options were available, and I'm not saying this for any purpose other than to the, for future reference. Um, I do believe you could accept um, this report and then ask the director to initiate a new uh, sort of complaint into an investigation into the higher-ups. I, I could see that being appropriate in other circumstances versus rejecting the report and, and doing that. I'm not suggesting that that be the action taken by the board today, but I did want to throw that out there for if there are future um, complaints where that might be more appropriate than, than a full rejection or return. This would actually be a return. Sorry. Mr. Kamaguchi. Yeah, and that was my clarifying question on return. So. I think it would make more sense for me, and this is just me speaking personally, that we return it, and when we get it back, it can, it has that full scope inside of this one uh, PRR. Um, I do want to also hold that we got somebody that is waiting on discipline, uh, talking about the per the complainants. So. Yeah, that's just, I'm just thinking out loud. So I'm not sure which way we go, but it makes sense. Either way, I think, makes a lot of sense. So, oh, Mr. Witzel. I like the idea of the full scope because I think it sets a precedent for um, the future. So. Okay, so the motion on Ms. Judge Brown? Uh, if there was a motion, I'd. I was going to suggest that, that uh, I think our legal advisor has got a good point. We need to microphone. Have I think the evidence is clear that the officer was negligent, but I do think that we do need to have them Push your button. report, which is set. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, wrong button. Sorry about that. Uh, I think our legal director is uh, it suggestion to approve this, but then have a director initiated report of the chain of command. Is appropriate. The, clear, the evidence seems pretty clear on the officer's uh, failure to test and uh, do things up front, regardless. And then a separate investigation, which would be different from this, uh, to go into the chain of command would be appropriate. But at least uh, 
the complainant at this point has has some action. If we send this back, we'll be four, five, six months coming back. And I, I think the the recommendation as to the officer is appropriate, but I do think we should have a director uh, investigation of the chain of command. And I would I would recommend that. It, if I'm not sure what what motion we've got there, but to the extent it needs a motion, that would be my motion. We approve and then start a director initiated uh, investigation of the of the chain of command as to why why the why it wasn't better followed up. But there was clearly an initial dismissal of the case that shouldn't have been. And I'd like to add that we, you know, the officer in this particular case has been notified of this discipline, so that's out there, as well as the complainant in this case. We've had contact with her, um, and so we do have two people who are waiting for some type of, um, you know, response to this. Um, we could do it either way; it's fine. But I did want you to know that and let that, you know, resonate with you that officer is aware of this PR and the discipline as well as to complain it. Um, even though she's in Colorado, she has. we have been in constant contact with her. So the, the motion on the floor is to reject. Do we want to return? Do we want to amend that motion? Is that amendable? Why don't we uh, withdraw that motion? Who will make the motion? We'll draw that motion. Well, there's a motion on the floor that we need to vote on. Or no. We can vote it down. Or we can. Well, the person. Right, the last the, motion the person I heard that was from originally Michigan. made the motion can withdraw that motion, mm -hmm. and then we can restate a motion, where we can go ahead and suspend the, the officer, and then continue the, the investigation for for the supervisor. Okay, Mr. Or, Goddard. Or if the movement doesn't want to do that, we have to vote on that motion and then go from there. Got it, Mr. Gamaguch. Do you rescind your motion? Um. So I would I would like to rescind my motion, uh, but offer up a new motion, uh, move to accept with the um, accept with an adjustment that there's a direct initiated um, investigation on the command staff. I second that motion. Thank you, Ms. McCree. Any focused discussion on that motion, Mr. Hayes? Okay. So I assume that uh, if we if we do go ahead and approve, accept this uh, version, that uh, when you do a new uh, investigation, that you just reference, you can reference this investigation, that you're going to reference this, yeah. You're going to reference the document. Yeah, that we, it'll yeah. just be, oh, yeah. um, it, it will probably, we will, no, we will probably give it a, the same case number, but just add a D as director initiated. Okay. As a, you know, as an amendment or an appendix to this one. Okay, thank you. Any more focused discussion, Mr. Wynn? What will be is be a continuing investigation. This officer will get suspended, and you will continue the investigation from what the supervisor done, part they took place in. It's a continuous, ongoing investigation, what it is. Mr. Wynn? Yeah, there's something to consider, and that is, was the officer following orders from the supervisor? And is not mentioning the supervisor to keep that supervisor out of trouble. I'm not accusing anybody here. I'm just saying these are possibilities. These are humans we're dealing with. So that's not clear in this case. So would it be fair to the officer to hold them accountable in a, in a recommended suspension without reviewing what their supervisor told them to do or not to do? Uh, and so it, does the officer have that kind of discretion to, again, it goes back to my original question, do they have the, the, the ability to clear a case without supervision? So if they don't, then what supervisor told them to tell this victim anything about this case or to clear the case. So are we, you know, we're getting the cart before the horse by recommending the officer be suspended without the supervisor's accountability examined, just to, just to consider. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. Uh, Assistant Director Clausey. The only thing that I would want to add on that is kind of similar to the other investigation that we had where 
the officer that we were interviewing was told to be honest, to be truthful, to give us all the information. That was not said in the investigation. So I think that as part of the responsibility that lies with a person sitting across the table from an investigator or across the phone is to be honest. And if they were told by their supervisor that that's the way they do that, then that's what should have been said in that interview. I just look at it like that. Thank you. Any more focus, Judge Brown? No. no. My understanding was the officer was interviewed and basically didn't blame anybody else, just said that said what they said, so the officers had a chance to, to respond if the uh, officer was, was told by the commander to close the case or we don't investigate these. And that, that they'd had a full opportunity to say that and hadn't said it, as I understand it, or, or did I miss something? No, the officer didn't say anything about anyone else. And they are afforded that opportunity when they're read their, you know, their, the, the, the Garrity rights that we read to them. And, you know, I think that, you know, one of the things that happens is, you know, if officers aren't up front, you know, and then they get these PRRs, it seems to be now a pattern that they're like, well, wait, what, is, what about this? Oh, what about that? And they have that opportunity. And then they also have ample time if they want to rescind and modify their response and they don't do it and they don't take advantage of that. But they should, just like with OPA, they are directed to tell the truth during these processes. And I get that there is some type of um, hesitation to talk about um, when your supervisor is telling you to do or or even ha having you don't owe, you're omitting information. I understand that. But I also understand, they, they know, just like the commanders and the captains all the way down the chain of command, know that when you're sitting in front of an investigator who is doing an internal investigation regarding um, an allegation, your obligation is to be truthful. There is a whole, there's a whole discipline section on truthfulness. And so, I, you know, my suggestion would be to discipline the officer and then open up an investigation and look at those exact things that you presented to us, Mr. Wynn, um, as well as if, in fact, the commander had given them a directive of not to do this, right? I don't even, you know, the commander sends an email to the woman and they open up the investigation. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, whoever's responsible, we know that there was something wasn't done that should have been done in this investigation. They had ample opportunity to do it, and they didn't. And so, um, you know, this particular complainant will never know who is accountable for giving her son fentanyl. So. Mr. Holloway. I think the officer knows uh, they've they been doing it for years. Even when I left, if you want to get fired, you get caught up in a lie. So it ain't no secret. So let's deal with it. The motion on the floor is to accept the recommendations and initiate a director initiated investigation. Yep. Uh, let's go ahead and vote on that. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So the motion passes. Thank you, Director Fitcher. All right, and lastly, we have MNCO CC 2021-011. Um, this case is a citizen referred complaint. Um, the MNCO received on March the 26th, 2021 about an incident that occurred on January the 13th, 2020. The complainant reported that two officers, Officer A and Officer B responded to a 911 call involving his neighbor and they arrested the complainant for felony aggravated assault without justification. The three allegations investigated in the complaint are that officers A and B each obstructed the complainant's rights by falsely arresting him and that officer A failed to adhere to the policy and rules regarding preliminary investigations. From the MNCO investigative report and exhibits, I concluded the material facts to be that the complainant and the neighbor had made multiple 911 calls in the four to five years leading up to the call on this incident date, including ones when officer A was the responding officer. 
Officer A notes being aware of the ongoing feud over property line disputes and referring them to civil court. On this particular incident, the complainant alleges that the neighbor was driving his bulldozer at 5.30 p.m. in January, drunk, and that the complainant went out and stood by the property line. The, a 911 dispatcher recorded that the neighbor called 911 at 5.32 p.m., that the neighbor was alleging the complainant had his hand in his pocket with a pistol in it, had pulled a gun on him before, that he had he had the gun out and was going to run the complainant over with his bulldozer. He was done, that it's been four years, and he is about to make the complainant use the gun. At 7.02 p.m., the officers arrive and split up to interview the neighbor of the complainant and the complainant one-on-one. -on -one. Officer A speaks to the neighbor while Officer B speaks to the complainant. Officer A hears from the neighbor that the complainant had his hand in his pocket and never pulled out a firearm, but he believed it to be a 380. The basis of the neighbor's belief that it was a 380 type pistol is not known. At about 707, Officer A approaches to where Officer B and the complainant are. The first and only question Officer A asked of the complainant is, how are we going to resolve this? And the complainant responds, for you to do your job. Officer A then informs complainant he is under arrest for aggravated assault without further inquiry. The entire interaction from when Officer B initially making contact with the complainant to when Officer A arrests the complainant is only a few minutes long. The evidence shows that no further questions or investigation were conducted to determine the complainant's side of the story. When asked by the MNCO investigator what would have happened if the complainant had responded differently, Officer A responded, it would depend on what the complainant's response was. I don't know what his response would be, and I couldn't tell you what I would have done. When asked after that, you felt the only possible thing was to arrest, and Officer A responded, yes, ma'am. When asked, how do you know that the neighbor was telling the truth? Officer A responded, I went off the victim statement. The OPA investigative report determined that, as complainant provided no information or statement to counter or explain his side of the story, officer then placed complainant under arrest. However, in Officer A's written incident report, Officer A writes that the complainant did speak to Officer B, that the complainant denied the allegations made by the neighbor, and that he specifically denied owning a 380 pistol. When interviewed, Officer B reported the same. It is undisputed that complainant did not have a weapon on him at the time of his arrest. Officer A reported noticing that the neighbor was visibly upset, his octave was in range of someone who was upset, and the complainant's demeanor was calm. After his arrest, the complainant had multiple court dates where the neighbor did not appear after being subpoenaed, and the case was ultimately dismissed. I concluded as to the one count against Officer B that he stood by as Officer A falsely arrested him, that allegation is unfounded. The evidence showed that Officer B did speak to Officer A and report what the complainant said, but he may have done this after the complainant was put in the patrol vehicle and not in his hearing. As to the false arrest allegation against Officer A, I concluded that this was a policy exoneration. The reason it is a policy exoneration and not simply not sustained is that the evidence showed that a negligent or reckless false arrest may have occurred due to the officer failing to investigate per police. However, the MMPD manual only disciplines intentional or knowing false arrest in its obstruction of rights policy. A negligent or reckless false report, I'm sorry, false arrest may be grounds for civil rights violation but not an MMPD policy violation. The one allegation I did sustain is concluding that Officer A did not follow policy as it relates to pre preliminary investigations. Specifically, he did not speak to the complainant or confer with Officer B about the complainant's version of the events or do any other investigation with regard to the neighbor's inconsistent story about the complainant prior to his arrest of the complainant. Had the officer done so, the outcome per the officer's own statement during the interview with the MNCO investigator may have been different and the complainant may not have been arrested.
This is a violation of the MMPD manual 4.20040A, the adherence to policy and rules by failing to follow policy regarding a preliminary investigation as stated in the MMPD manual 15.30.010. This is typically a category D violation, but may vary by the severity of the offense. The officer's relevant disciplinary history is an oral reprimand in 2020 for profanity using the N-word, a Category F first offense, a written reprimand in 2018 for discourtesy, a Category F first offense. I recommend that this be categorized as a typical Category D first offense. The disciplinary action first offense Category D is between one and four-day suspension, and I am recommending a four-day suspension. And that concludes it. And I'll take questions. Thank you, Director Fitcher. Mr. Goddard. Uh, yeah, I've, I'm troubled by this one. Um, and I got one question and several things to say. If I'm reading it right, uh, the officer that, that was, uh, the complaint was false arrest and, and concluded it didn't violate policy, made the arrest having heard from one party and not the other in terms of what factually happened. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. It, at the risk of sounding incredibly pompous, one of the earliest things I learned practicing law was when I heard one side of a story, I had heard one side of the story. And it's not reasonable to make a decision based on that. And then I'd like to add to that, like we're talking about an aggravated assault arrest. And right. the, if, if he was, in fact, you know, sentenced, I mean, he would have spent a significant amount. Oh, yeah, of, it's a serious uh, felony. Understand. It's a very serious offense, yes. Second of three things, that was first. I want to quote from the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. In relevant part, it says, the right of the people to be secure in their persons against unreasonable seizures shall not be violated. That's 18th century language for it has to be reasonable to arrest somebody. The policy violation, the, the, the one that we can't stick, is, is, is what you included says employees shall not knowingly deprive any person of any right which they are entitled by law or rules and regulations of metro government. Clearly, the right not to be unreasonably arrested uh, is a right to which they're entitled, Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. Knowingly, in, in my area of practice, it relates to facts. If you made a mistake of fact, that means your violation wasn't knowing. It doesn't mean that you knew what you were doing was a violation of law. And I think putting all this together, I believe the standard is was that a reasonable arrest. And not that the facts, what's not unre sorry, what's, what's unreasonable is not balancing all the facts available. The officer thought one thing and acted on that. It is that he intentionally made an arrest for a serious felony, having heard one side of the story when the other side was standing there and perfectly willing to give his side of the story. And I would find, and I'm looking for, for Mr. Yoon to, to advise on legal as well, I would find that is a violation of knowingly depriving a person of the right to which they were entitled. And I suppose the recommendation would be to refer back for consideration of that in a revision, or we could up it to a B if we wanted to, as I understand things. But let me, without getting to what we should do if the board agrees with what I've said, let me mm -hmm. ask that they respond, please. Other members comment. So just to be clear, your, your suggestion is that it be returned and amended to include um, MMPD Manual 4.20.040K, Obstruction of Rights? Well, let me change my mind. If we are comfortable today with the logic I just described and, and uh, Mr. Yoon's comfortable, I, that would be my recommendation, not a motion yet. I want to hear right. others' comments, but yes, we do. If there's question about the legal option there, I would recommend we refer it for further investigation of that, if that makes sense. But again, we'll, we'll get there when I've heard more discussion, I think. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. Mr. Hayes. I just wanted to highlight you know, something that was in a report where it's, it said that basically the officer arrested this complainant because he asked the question, how are we going to resolve this? And the complainant just responded and said, for you to do your job. And that's typically there are a number of people in this country that that's why sometimes when it comes to police officers, that's why they're nervous because 
just a statement like that, and this officer just decided, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to arrest you because you, you said for you to do your job. So I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Mr. Kamaguchi. To respond to board member uh, Goddard's inquiry on like his, his suggestion, I would see that as comparable. Um, like you said before, we have an officer getting one side of the story and then making a felony arrest based on that one side of the story. So I, don't, I wouldn't see any issue as a board member supporting a motion to, uh, to like move up to a category B with 60 month retention and 18 to 13 days suspension. Um, okay. I, I'm a little confused um, because we, okay. So the obstruction of rights, which was the first allegation that we, um, we on that particular, he was exonerated. It sounds like both Mr. Goddard and what you're saying, based on what Mr. Goddard said and what's in this report, is that the policy is the issue here, right? And maybe what we should do is also include an update to their policy, right? Because their policy basically, what it says is, um, Per MMPD's current policy to constitute false arrest, the officer's mental state must be knowing or intentional, higher legal thresholds than recklessness or negligence. Um, and so thus a gap exists in policy between an officer whose negligence or reckless, recklessness leads to the false arrest of an individual versus an officer who knowingly or intentionally falsely arrests someone. So, it's, um, so since Officer A denies knowingly or intentionally falsely arresting a complainant, even though I, may, I believe that um, the arrest was not justified under these circumstances, the policy says uh, that, well, basically the policy exonerates it since it's not proven that the officer was knowingly or intentionally obstructed the, the, compl um, the complainant's rights. So does this sound like more of a update and change to the policy, the wording in the policy maybe? Um, Under the policy as written, I, I'm saying there's a, a sound legal basis, I think, as one lawyer amongst many, that he violated the policy as written. Not, not the false arrest in that precise definition, but the knowingly deprived a person of a right to which they're entitled by law. And the right is not to be arrested unreasonably. And the violation is that his acts here were unreasonable. He didn't get to decide whether they're reasonable or not. That's not what knowingly means. He knew those facts, and they added up to unreasonable in, in my read. Second, I think a recommendation to go with it to the, the, the department would be um, to have some clarification of that. If the department believes these acts should be just a Category F, we need to have a serious discussion about that. If they agree that these acts are problematic and should be a B or something in that nature, then the recommendation would be to write policy and have training such that that's abundantly clear to the, the force. Okay. But the motion right now is, is uh, do we have a motion? I don't know if we have a motion. The, the discussion right now is B and 8 to 13, as um, Member Camelgooch stated. Mr. Uh, just because I was, uh, it was asked of me a couple of times in different ways, but no, I don't disagree with uh, uh, Member Goddard's um, uh, discussion or statements regarding the legality of what I would consider this to be a rejection of the director's conclusion as it related to that allegation. Instead of it being a policy exoneration, it would just be sustained, and that would take 51 percent or the majority of the board to believe that the facts as demonstrated um, violate uh, or, or can sustain that allegation that the knowingness doesn't modify he knew it was false arrest but that he knowingly obstructed a right um, but in failing to follow the fourth amendment actually to be clear i i don't think we've got a disagreement on fact i'm being real technical here I, so i don't think he gets into the more likely than not it's just what given the, the policy given the law with these facts, what conclusion do we come to? That that's the difference of, of opinion, I think. Right. So I think that I think that we could just 
instead of where we have not sustained, is that what we have? Exoneration by I'm sorry, exoneration by policy, you all can make the decision to um, reject that, modify it uh, to a um, sustained, you can do that in the meeting. And then um, we would look at the discipline and he's already looked at it and it said what he thought it was for category B. Is that correct? Okay. Is there a motion? I move that we. Uh, yes. I'm going to make a motion. You'll you'll tell me whether I understood or not. How about that? <laughs> the appropriate motion, I believe, is to move that we accept the report with the modification to sustain this charge. Um, and then I would suggest a 13-day suspension, um, given the, the comments uh, Mr. Hayes had about the other the conduct during the, the process here. Is did we, Mr. Yoon, do we have to reject it or can we accept and change accept it? Accept but modify. Accept and modify. I think you can do either. I think they <laughs> both get you to the same place. Okay. Is there a second? Any focus discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Pulling up the agenda here. Um, now we move to public comment and, oh, one. Then we have a public comment. So before we get to the public comment, I'm um, gonna read an impact statement from one of the cases that we considered today. Um, it's by Aaron McDermott and it's the Reinbold impact statement. Back in April, 2020, me and three small children I nanny for, ages three, six, and seven at the time, were verbally assaulted and abused on a public bike path in, in the neighborhood where the children lived in Brentwood, Tennessee. That day and the year and a half following, have been extremely traumatic and has negatively impacted my life in almost every conceivable way. It was brought to our attention the day after the encounter that the man I had caught on, the cam on camera and the kids and the kids called the bad man was in fact Jason Reinbold, an on-duty captain with the Metro Nashville Police Department. What the camera didn't catch that day was Officer Reinbold calling me sexist and disparaging names, calling the children effing coronavirus kids, screaming obscenities while punching his back door with his fist, and blasting sexually explicit rap music, presumably in an attempt to intimidate a defenseless woman and three small children. The rest of the encounter was caught on video and was equally frightening and disturbing. The only reason I hit re the record was because I was genu genuinely afraid he was going to physically harm us and it was, only, it was my only defense. The things that have come to light in the months after the incident with Off Officer Reinbold have been extremely traumatizing not only for me but the children I cared for and loved as well as their parents. Due to the incident on the bike path and the allegations of abuse against Officer Reinbold, our fear turned to dread. Both the family and I installed security systems at our homes as we were unsure of what Reinbold was capable of. We stopped walking on the bike path and going to the rock wall, a place we would visit often to collect fossils and crystals. We were afraid to simply walk down the street or allow the children to play in the yard. Keep in mind, Reinbold's children attended the same school as the oldest, which caused me a great deal of fear anytime I went to the school. For months after, the children continued to ask about the bad man. They were confused and scared. They didn't understand why we couldn't go back to the bike path. They had been taught that the police were the good guys. How do you explain to a three, six, and seven-year-old why a police officer who swore an oath to protect them was cursing at them and encouraging them to throw rocks at him? It's heartbreaking to have to explain to a child that their perceived heroes are now people they need to be afraid of, that I am also afraid of. As a survivor of sexual abuse and rape, hearing the stories of Reinbold's other victims firsthand 
brought all of the feelings I had experienced as a victim myself to resurface. It re-traumatized me in a profound way. I became incapacitated with anxiety. I started seeing a therapist and was prescribed medication for panic attacks. I was unable to work some days because I was afraid to see him in the neighborhood, which happened several times over the last year. I was afraid I was going to lose my job due to the absences from work. Also, the story has been all over the news for over a year, and my name has been publicly shared repeatedly. Every new report continues to re-traumatize me, especially since no real justice has been served for myself or any of his victims. I have been harassed online, not only by members of the public, but from fellow MNPD officers who are making threats against me in a Facebook group that they thought was private. Not only have I been afraid of Officer Reinbold, I have been afraid of Metro Nashville Police in general, including OPA, who contacted my friends personally in an attempt to intimidate them into giving OPA my personal information. I have not had a sound night of sleep since the incident occurred. It's been a roller coaster of emotions. Several months ago, Officer Reinbold was caught accessing personal and confidential information from an internal database in an effort to retaliate against his victims. I was told by OPA that he didn't access my information, but I found out later that he may have in fact done so. This re-traumatized me yet again. I was afraid that he knew where I lived or that he would seek physical or punitive retribution against me. To say that this experience has been traumatic would be a gross understatement. Ultimately, the family who I worked with for five years made the decision to move out of Tennessee in June of 2021, in large part because of Jason Reinbold and what transpired over the last year. I lost my job because of Reinbold and all of us, including the children and their parents, lost our sense of safety. I have not only been a victim of Officer Reinbold's abuse, but also by MNPD's willingness to remain complicit with this type of behavior. There is a systemic culture of abuse that has been rewarded within the department, which is clearly evident by the 39 women who have heroically come forward with their allegations of abuse and racism. I am asking you, as a victim, a survivor, a taxpayer, and a concerned citizen to not reward Jason Reinbold with the ability to ever work as an officer of the law again, here or anywhere in the, else in this country. What message would that be sending to our community, to women, to our children, if we continue to allow officers like Reinbold to act with impunity? Thank you, Aaron McDermott. Now we have public comment. Can you press the button on, yeah. Um, my name is Erin McDermott, and um, I'm the nanny that just wrote the letter, and um, I don't need to reiterate everything that was in there. I basically just came down to make sure that Chris was a real human being, as we've <laughs> had quite an experience over the last year and a half um, working through this kind of ever-evolving situation, um, not only with Officer Reinbold with, but with also Metro Nashville Police Department. Um, I, I know some of you know that uh, NPR just released a podcast about this particular situation, and um, it, it just, it just really, it's very indicative of what I feel like is a fundamental issue within the department, and probably that is the case uh, across the country in most police departments. Um, but it really just shed a light for me, on really what needs to happen. <laughs> and one of the main reasons why I'm here tonight is not only, I'm, I'm also a social, social justice um, advocate. I work as a um, art coordinator for the Women's March, and I've done other social justice work within the community here and when I lived in Vermont. And I think that one of the reasons why this particular situation ended up the way it, it did is because I am savvy and I am assertive. And had Officer Reinbold um, attacked me and I didn't have this type of experience, he would have 100% gotten away with it. And um, I think, again, just because of my experience with this and because I was so willing to be public about what had happened, that was the only reason why there was any real you know, uh, consequences for him. Um, and that being said, I do just want to say thank you all for all the work that you're doing. I know that this is very important work, and that is one of the reasons why I trusted the COB with this information um, prior to even going to OPA. You guys were the first folks that I called, so I just want to thank you.
so much. Thank you, Ms. McDermott. Any other public comment, Director Fitchard? Nope. Yeah. Then any new business or announcements? Mr. Kamel Gooch. First, let me say thank you for uh, giving us those great words. Um, I'm glad that this is, a, this is a space where folks feel comfortable being heard and expressing vulnerable um, and harmful encounters with MMPD. Um, but I, and I, excuse me for being late, but I, I wanted to return back to the conversation around the license plate readers. Um, yesterday, there was a public hearing, I think the first public hearing um, on license plate readers. And ironically, it's happening at a point in time where we have two bills that are back on the floor. And then also, we received an email to uh, answer some of the questions of the inquiries that we've had. And, and if you look through that email, we have conflicting answers to similar questions. Um, and so I know our, our board hasn't taken an official position but I do think that we, I, at this point, our official position should be to defer any type of bills that are coming because both the information that was said last night was different from the information that we received on the email, which is different from the information that we're receiving from other parties that are all should be getting the same information because they're involved in all of this. So I wanted to come here tonight, present that one. And two, like, ask board members how would they feel to have an official position that the license plate legislation needs to be deferred? Any discussion response to Mr. Kamel Gooch? Can you talk, Mr. Holloway? I don't have a problem for it being deferred. Um, I think I spoke about it about a month or two ago. And um, if it's used properly, it could be a good tool. And it's just like when they talk about putting up uh, cameras in the neighborhood, people cried about it and said, invade my privacy. But the cameras have proven to have solved major crime. But, but if we're getting conflicting information, I think it ought to be deferred until we're on the right track so we can all understand what they really, what it's representing. Mr. Kamel Gooch. Yeah, and I want to mention like, Yesterday, there was a similar inquiry happening around the data for the license plate readers is still nationally is still up in the air. But we have data on MMPD, right? And so there was a lot of cautious happening, caution, caution happening because of also who's using the tools, right? Which I think speaks to what you just said. But even in the, I mean, I'm getting, I mean, and we haven't dealt with this. I think this is a different topic. What do we do when officers whistle blow to us, right? Because I'm getting officers telling me different information that I'm getting from other, that, that we're getting from more traditional things. I think even in the, in the email that we received, it was like, there's only one license plate reader that's been borrowed from someone else. But then other officers are saying that there's multiple license plate readers that are, that are being used all across the whole city. So I wanted to hold that because it's also conflicting information inside of the department happening at the same time. Mr. Hayes and then Ms. McCree. Uh, to answer, um Mr. Camel Gooch, I, I, I don't have an issue with deferring. It seems like it is a number of unanswered questions that's out there. It's, it, and, and when you think about the license plate readers, and I think about when we did the body cameras and everything, they're all kind of meetings and back and forth. And, and 
there hasn't been a lot of that. And, and I think one of the main things, and I think uh, uh, the chair had mentioned that about uh, uh, community engagement. Now, it was good that there have been some meetings recently, but I, I think there probably needs to be more of that. So I don't, I don't have any issue with uh, supporting that. Um, I'm in agreement with deferring um, this, this process on those two bills. And what I will say is that while we've seen several council members over the last year come to talk about these bills, and I know there have been, at one point, was there five, Jamel? on the license plate readers. It's, it's, it's six up to date. Six up to date and we have two on the floor. Um, a, I don't feel like we've had enough public comment on this about what people really feel. We've heard from the council members and we know majority of them support it, but the people um, in communities, and for me, I, I want to hear more from communities of color because I don't feel like they've been represented. Um, in, in the majority of these conversations, um, I want to hear more from low income communities in this conversation, and I don't feel like we've heard that yet. Um, and so until we get a the public comment and then consistent information on this issue, I am in agreement with deferring. Thank you, Ms. McCree. Um, Dr. Villier, would you happen to know when the bills would both be up for third reading? Uh, both bills will be on second reading at the first meeting in November. Um, the, and if both were to move past that, so I was trying to look at the calendar, um, I believe it would be on the 16th if they were to follow the schedule uh, and on to third reading would be the me a meeting on the 16th, I believe. Mm. And uh, our board next board meeting is scheduled for November uh, 12th, is that correct? 19th, I'm sorry. My only, um, yeah, Ms. McCree. And just for the sake of public comment, if, Jamil, you may be the best person for this, but what are the next dates of these council me meetings so that the public has the opportunity to attend? He just, Yeah, November the 4th and the 16th. Thank you. And I just want to reiterate, I think you might miss, and Jamel, that Dr. Hildreth did mention um, that there was some budget issues and concerns and where they were going to be funded. So just to bring that back around and include that in that conversation. Go ahead, Dr. Dr. Hildreth. Uh, thank you. So speaking of... Um, at first, Member Campbell Gooch, I was wondering, you said deferred, and I'm thinking deferred until what? What's the trigger? So when all the conversations coming together, if we don't meet again until November 19th, I would be interested in asking representatives of the different interests we mentioned. So public comment from the community. Um, the police department, if they wanted to speak to this matter directly, someone who would give us definitive information about the funding and budget issues. And uh, when we talked about public comment, maybe specifically um, taking a page out of the notebook from the Human Relations Commission when they have had listening tours and they've asked for listening around certain demographics. So you mentioned low income, you mentioned communities of color. If we could ask that at the November 19th meeting, we were able to hear that this would be a place for at the Community Oversight Board as we continue to live into the reputation of trust that we are engendering, that if we heard that then, then third reading could do what it does after the 19th. So somehow, I, I think I'm supporting a motion to ensure that either second reading or third reading is deferred until after November 19th. 
and at the November 19th, we will dedicate sufficient space on the agenda to this issue. Is that a motion? Or, okay, I so move. I second that motion. Thank you. Any focus discussion on that? I think um, what you could do is do one letter and have all the council people name on it and make sure that you come from this board say asking them to defer it to meeting and that that way all of them know that how we feel about it we want, we want more information about it but if you will can you defer it to meeting I accept that amendment to the motion second any more focused discussion on that Mr. Campbell Gooch yeah and I would I would wanted to explicitly say the first second reading because the first second reading because both of them are on second reading now so okay. I'm saying like the first second reading till December accepted any more focused discussion all okay. in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. aye aye any opposed no thank you mr. Brown the eyes have it um, the motion passes so I will write a letter to council asking for the deferral. I have, I have one more announcement, because I know we're about to go. Yeah. But I can't leave without saying, go Big Blue. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Um, I'll take a motion to adjourn. I think got another word. Is there a motion? I move to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a second? A second. All in favor of adjourning the meeting? Aye. Uh, Aye. There. Great. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.